Let's get peppy. Welcome to Pep 140. We're into the roaring 140s, Dave. Uh, this is Pep or Plane Extra podcast. It's an offshoot of Plane America on the ABC Australia, which on which you can see us on Friday at 8 p.m. on ABC News Channel. And we'll fact be returning next Wednesday uh, on, uh, at, at 9.30. And uh, you can also see us on iView and on Facebook at ABC Plane America and on YouTube at the ABC In-Depth Channel. On Pep, we cover all the stuff that's too nerdy for TV. And if you're listening, you can also see this podcast on Facebook and YouTube where you will see Dr. Pepper himself, Dr. Dave Smith. Dave, hello there. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. David Smith. I'm an Associate Professor at the US Study Centre at the University of Sydney. However, I do not speak for either of those institutions. That is correct. I can vouch for that. I can also say we do not speak for any political campaign because if you've Listen to Pep over the last mm. few years, you'll know whatever suggestion we ever make about anything anyone should do, they don't do it. That's true. Even though we know they're listening. They're all listening. They're they all are peppers. absolutely ignoring our suggestions. Mm. Well, I did suggest Ryan Binkley run for president. Oh, okay. And so he, he did follow that advice. Yes. It was good advice. He netted a few more votes this week. <laughs> yes. But anyway, yeah. so I'm not speaking for no. anyone except myself. No. Okay. Well, look, i tell you uh, some more details about who you're – well, not well, when you're not speaking for these people. Yes. Uh, for those at home, we actually recording this on a Thursday. We are. Yeah. Now, normally we record – uh, in between the recording of uh, the Planet America on Friday lunchtime, and when and when uh, Planet America goes to air, and then I edit this this podcast. But since Australia Day is tomorrow on Friday, yes, we are recording this on Thursday. It's a little experiment. Mm. See how we go. Well, yes. We'll, well, I'm not going to observe the public holiday because I'm making Planet America tomorrow. But you can observe the public holiday for both of us, Dave. No. Uh, okay, that's fine. Uh, for the, for our American viewers who are a little bit confused as to why anyone's doing anything on Australia Day, uh, in Australia we, we work a little bit differently to uh, to you Americans in a number of our, look. We're very close to America in a lot of ways. Yeah, but when it comes to our national day, we are very very different. Mm. Essentially. Uh, at least half, if not more than half of Australia, hates Australia Day for a start. Mm. And uh, and the other half just like the lamb ads. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically how Australia Day works. So there isn't there, there isn't a lot of observance of public holidays and all the rest of it. But anyway, we are, we are going to observe public holiday on PEP. Mm. So if we are out of date by 24 hours, because yes. this is going to come out at the usual time. Oh, yes. It won't come out at 4 a.m. Yeah, 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 yeah. ma- maybe it'll come out when the actual show's on at yes. 8 p.m because I have a bit more time, uh, give us a bit of uh, bit of patience. By the way, I've got a question for our South Australian peppers mm. because one of the things about Australia Day that is a bit off is that it's actually the it, – it celebrates the foundation of the colony of New South Wales, mm. uh, not the entire country. Other states actually have their own celebrations around their own foundation. I and didn't sa- even know that. Yeah, yeah. The <laughs> South, the South Australian one, because growing up in Adelaide, yeah. I was aware of this, is Proclamation Day. Okay. Which happens on December twenty eighth. And what I, a bullshit day that is. Well, it's got a long and controversial <laughs> history. At least hold it in September. Who a- cares what the it. date is? Like, 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 it doesn't have to be the real day. So just hold it when there's no public holiday. No, because I holiday? think that there was the original intention was to turn Christmas into a three day holiday, but oh. retailers revolted uh, against it. So it's got a long and controversial history. Is it a public holiday? Not anymore. Oh. No, I think that it, it got pulled into line with the rest of the country in 1993 and there were also <laughs> surveys done suggesting most South Australians didn't know what it was or what it was commemorating. <laughs> I I was kind of aware of it because my primary school was in Glenelg, which is the suburb, mm. the it's the beachside, the bayside suburb where the actual proclamation of South Australia happened. There was this withered old gum tree, which is mostly concrete now. Uh, there's this replica of the, the British ship called the Buffalo uh, and, the, yeah, the emblem of our school was the Buffalo. So we were kind of – we were probably kind of more aware of it of most South Australians, but I'd, I'd just be intrigued to know whether Proclamation Day is a thing at all 
in South Australia anymore. So are you soliciting feedback on I that? am soliciting feedback okay. from South Australian peppers. Where okay. I'm, I'm guessing there are a few of you. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, please, yeah. Uh, in the comments. And uh, I'll solicit feedback from you. What are you grateful for? I'm grateful for the political scientist Hans Knoll. Ooh. Now, Hans Knoll is one of the authors of The Party Decides, which yeah. was an incredibly influential book, which has been kind of maligned uh, <laughs> since Trump got elected in 2016 because the thesis of The Party Decides was that party elites have a huge amount of power over the selection of nominees. Uh, even though the process is now done through primaries, their argument was that party elites can pretty effectively vet who actually makes mm. it to that point in the first place. Um, now, 2016 Republican primaries was a major counterexample to that, although it has to be said it actually has predicted just about every race uh, pretty effectively, including the 2016 and 2020 Democratic races. And also things can change. Yeah, yeah things can. It doesn't mean they're wrong. Things just can things, change. Things can change. Absolutely. Yeah. So it, it is still a book worth reading, even though there's a very significant counterexample to it. Now, uh, but the, the reason why I'm mentioning uh, Hans at this point, who I vaguely knew because he was uh, at Michigan for a few years when I was there, uh, was on his Facebook page. He's been posting all of these photos from the New Hampshire primary and it's a great reminder of how if you live in New Hampshire and Iowa, you can meet any political candidate you want. Mm. Well, may, maybe not an incumbent president, but basically anybody else. Yeah. He's got photos of everybody from, uh, you know, Vermin Supreme and Marion Will Williamson to um, Matt Gates uh, and Nikki Haley, but best of all, He's got a selfie with George Santos. Oh, I, think I thought you were say Binkley. Yeah, no. <laughs> George Santos has inserted himself into uh, into New Hampshire. This was he's been campaigning for who? No, he wasn't campaigning. He was just turning up to people's parties. <laughs> that sounds very Santos. <laughs> yeah, yes. Like during the desperately dull New Hampshire vote count, yeah. uh, you know, the, the live updates were coming through. Jonathan Swan was like, "Guess who's just turned up to Trump's watch party? It's George Santos." Anyway, George Santos is available for selfies uh, if you happen to be anywhere near a primary contest where there might be cameras around. Uh, but I don't know how many more of them we're actually going to see. But anyway, uh, Hans has done a great job of documenting New Hampshire, at least on his Facebook page. Thank you very much, Hans. Uh, it actually, actually moves very nicely into my grateful one because yes. I'm talking about people going up to Matt Gates. In ah, New Hampshire. Right. So it works out perfectly. Yes. Perfect segue. Is it because they want to talk about parenting with him? Definitely not. Definitely not. I am grateful for the Matt Gates trolls. There is an <laughs> army of Matt Gates trolls out there. For those who don't, those who are new to Pep, uh, Matt Gates has been investigated for some time now. Yes. For potentially soliciting sex with minors. Mm. Uh, the Department of Justice looked into him and they said he had no case to answer. We need to be very, very clear about yes. that. Uh, the House Ethics Committee is continuing to look into him. In mm -hmm. fact, just this week, there was news that they were expanding their investigation mm -hmm. and uh, Matt Gates had some sass for them. But, no. uh, he's full of sass, old Matt. Yep. Uh, also full of sus. That's the problem. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure anything's going to come of that investigation, but you know, it's, it's ongoing. In the meantime, though, the trolls of America have delivered their verdict on Matt Gates, and they're doing it in the best possible way. Now, I'm going to play the clips. Mm. And then I'm going to tell you what happened after the clips because the clips are hard to understand. Yes. The audio is not great. The yeah. video is not great. Have you heard of any of this no. stuff? No. Oh, it's, it's great. Okay. So <laughs> last month, it started with last month, a dude got on stage at a Republican function mm -hmm. and he called Matt Gates up for an award and he presented him with this award. I'm now going to play you the results. Matt Gates, we have an award for you. My name is Mike. I'm with the Strong's Bellevue. GOP. The, the 2023 Strongsville GOP Award. Oh, thank you also. Congratulations for your dedication to using Venmo to allegedly paying underage girls to have sex with you. so full of it. Thank you all so much. So what you just watched 
was the guy comes on. He says, Matt Gates, we have an award for you. My name is Mike from the Strongsville GOP. And then Matt Gates comes on stage. He says, the Strongsville, the 2023 Strongsville GOP award. And Matt Gates says, thank you so much as he hands the award to him. And he says, congratulations for your dedication to using Venmo to allegedly pay underage <laughs> girls to have sex with you. And then Gates says, oh, come on, man. You're so full of it. While continuing to hold and examine his award, I might add, the guy gets pulled off stage by security. Gates continues to hold on to his award and then waves at the crowd and says, thank you Jesus. all so much. Continues to stay on stage looking at his award until someone else comes and takes it off him. Incredible. And then he looks awkward. So that's the first one. And I'm just <laughs> going to say, so some advice for Matt Gates, which we know you're not going to take because no one ever takes our advice. Mm, he's a pepper. If anyone says that they're going to give you an award... <laughs> Something like that yeah. is going to happen. There are no legit awards coming no your way, No one's Matt. giving you an actual <laughs> award. Okay. Okay, and this is the second one. This one's a real mess, but yeah. I'll play the clip and then I'll describe it. Okay. Oh, thanks for coming up. Thanks for your birthday. I brought you a bag full of underage girls. Hey, 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 hey. Come on, dude. You're a bag of underage girls. Get out, get out. If you so what is going on there? It's very confusing. A guy approaches Matt Gates with a bag with inflatable sex dolls in them. He pulls one out to show Matt Gates and he says, For your birthday, I brought you a bag of underage women. Gates smiles and says, dude, <laughs> the guy is immediately dragged out by attendees who keep on saying, get out, get out, get out, get out. As he tries to get his lines out, one of the lines is, it's a bag of underage girls. If you inflate them, it's much sexier. And then Gates just stays there with a fake smile while nervously rubbing his hands. <laughs> That's what they so, yeah, so these guys are the best. And if, if I could trade Trump's trials for a yeah. never-ending series of trolls approaching him with embarrassing yes. props yeah, for the yeah, rest yeah. of his life, I would do it in a heartbeat. <laughs> that is real justice as far as I'm concerned, especially given I bet Trump would deal with them with less humour than that. Yes, does. yeah, yeah. So uh, I love these guys. I'm very grateful for them. Keep on coming, guys. And I'm, I'm like, sure you're all you know, peppers. Yeah, uh, That's th real justice. This is actually quite high praise coming from <laughs> Chaz because yes. you may know that he used to do much – Better produced and I'd have to say more PG <laughs> versions of this kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, he was a troll before we really yeah. understood what the term troll meant. <laughs> yeah. And before I even really knew Chaz, yeah. I, I remember chortling at uh, the, him almost getting assaulted by Canterbury Bulldogs fans and uh, – uh, members of various security details uh, at, at, at occasions where he took his trolling right to the edge. It, so it, this is high praise coming from Chaz. It was a fun job while at the same time being, being simultaneously terrified. Yes. <laughs> so I do know exactly what those guys were going through, especially mm. given they probably weren't getting paid for it like I was. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I appreciate their work yeah. so much. And you were also doing it in, I suppose, what we can broadly call the pre-Taser era. Yeah. Yeah, yes. that's, that, that is true. But also yeah. the pre-security footage era. Oh, if yes. If they nailed me, they weren't going to get caught and they knew it. <laughs> <laughs> there were a few times when I was doing stuff for radio where I got nailed real hard. Ah, uh, yes. And, and there were times when I got nailed and I knew they knew they were being recorded and they didn't care. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> those days are now gone. Oh, dear. Anyway, I'm grateful for them. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's get into the main content. First of all, an update. Uh, update on Georgia. I spoke, spoke about Fawny Willis at yes. uh, length yep. and, and her situation last week. Uh, her uh, her counsel accused Joycelyn Wade in her divorce proceedings yep. of having an adulterous relationship with a friend of Nathan Wade's. Yeah. So she was accusing, she was saying that Nathan Wade was almost, well, that the relationship was already over yes. when they got together because yeah, yeah. of the, mm -hmm. this other relationship. Well, not, that it's, not, that it's, not that it's relevant, but she's basically poking the bear a bit here. Yeah. She uh, she also said that, this is a bit weird, that Joycelyn Wade had conspired with interested parties in the criminal election interference case to use the civil discovery process to annoy, embarrass, and oppress Willis. Now, the reason, now that, that's, that's almost insinuating that there's obstruction going yeah. on. Yeah. Which is dangerous when she's the one that charges people with obstruction, mm, right? Yes, that's a dodgy yeah, yeah. area, right? Yeah. 
Um, and that might not have been a great idea because then Joycelyn Wade responded by releasing bank records showing that Nathan Wade purchased airline tickets in his mm. and Farney Wallace's name yes. for trips to San Francisco and Miami. So this is the first actual proof yes. of the allegations released in response yeah, yeah. to, to uh, Wallace's claims. The, the barometer that I'm using for how this is going mm. is that in the New York Times and the Washington Post, no opinion columnists are leaping to Farney Wallace. Willis's defence. Ah, yes. And, you know, usually you do get someone uh, mm. leaping th- to the defence. Mm. Nobody is doing that this time. Yeah. No, I think you're right in your judgement of how it's going. Yes, this is uh, – <laughs> so she's – I don't think she's going to get a lot of support from the liberal establishment no. here. They are very much keeping their powder dry uh, and, on this issue. And potentially it's about to get worse because the judge is and has announced they're going to unseal the divorce case. As yeah, well, yeah, Which yeah. I don't think she wants. No. Um, uh, the and I should also say that the the counsel for uh, Joycelyn Wade uh, said this, and I have to agree agree with this that Miss Willis's implied threat to pursue charges against Joycelyn Wade and her counsel based on inconvenient facts from her personal life that are directly relevant to the ongoing divorce proceedings is an affront to the integrity of her office. I think I'd have to I'd have to say mm. implying that you might charge them with obstruction I think is not great. No, but anyway. That's going on. And the Fulton County Commissioner is now investigating Willis as well. So it's moving along pretty quickly. The judge yeah. in the case is going to... Judge got all, more quickly than the actual case. <laughs> oh, way more quickly. Yes. Judge McAfee uh, is apparently going to have his say in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so okay. We'll find out soon enough. That's one update. Another, another update uh, on Congress. We talked at length at the end of last year about the budgets that they had to that they had to pass by January 19. Yes. January 19 has come and gone. It has. <laughs> um, Schumer and Chuck Schumer, the Democrat Senate leader, and uh, Mike Johnson, the Speaker, the Republican House Speaker, uh, agreed to a deal a couple of weeks back for overall, overall spending level. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was um, no limit as part of their deal to con- conserve policy riders that yes. could be passed as part, but just said to say spending level. Conservatives were not happy. Chip Roy in particular, who's kind of the conservative's conservative. Mm. Uh, he was he made a big deal because there was basically Kevin McCarthy made an agreement yep. uh, with Chuck Schumer some time back. Yes. That if they pass no budget by April, yep. there would be spending caps. Yes. Those spending caps, now we're getting close to April. They are. Those spending caps are $70 million less than what Mike Johnson agreed to mm. just now. And so Chip Rowe was going, what are you doing? You're negoti- you, ha- you are holding the cards mm. and you are negotiating with Schumer in a way that w- there is more spending than there needs to be. Mm. And so he saw, he saw that as, a, as, a, as either incompetent or backstabbing, essentially. Um, Marjorie Taylor Greene has jumped in there. Remember, she... She was kind of Kevin McCarthy's right hand lady, and yes. she's and she's now always got something negative to say about Mike Johnson. Yep, uh, she's definitely his enemy. Uh, and see, she, she says she will not vote for the top line of the budget deal, regardless of what is in the legislation. She, she just won't vote for it, and that is important for what's coming up in a second. I should say she voted for she McCarthy's did. deal. She did the original deal. She did. But anyway. Uh, there's also strife because a number of conservatives uh, insist on immigration reform being part of the budget. Yep. And Johnson has said that will not be the case. No. Um, and now I should say, though, there is a qual- qualifier there. He he has been talking to Trump lately, and I get the feeling that Trump doesn't want there to be immigration reform. No, of course he doesn't. Because obviously that would, would help yes. Biden in the yeah, election. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like immigration is Trump's. No, he has made it very clear. Yeah, ACE, yes. essentially, in this election. Yeah, yeah. he doesn't want any immigration yeah. Ukraine deal. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. No. So, yeah. So, um, but anyway, but a lot of, a few Republicans are a bit sore about that as well. Yes. There's been a number of meetings held with conservatives where they came out saying that Johnson promised one thing or another, and then Johnson said he didn't make any promises whatsoever, so they're losing trust with each other at the moment mm. as well. Uh, they've they've started doing the stuff that they did with McCarthy, which is not voting for basic rules. Yep. Which didn't happen before this Congress ever, and now <laughs> seems to happen all the time. Um Worst of all, remember I highlighted a few months back that Mike Johnson promised, he made one promise about all this, yep. there'd be no more continuing resolutions yes. after January. And I highlighted it at the time. You I said, did. You were so, so happy about this. Yes. I said, so we'll see about that. Was, did he even make the what I'm grateful for 
cut no, at he one didn't. point? Uh, he might. Yes, he did. He did. But not yeah. like this. Not like this. Okay. He, it, it, what, what he made the Grateful For cut was because he was actually doing a proper right. good faith negotiation. Okay, yes, yeah. Which I was shocked by. Yeah. <laughs> and Grateful For. But uh, anyway, um, they've extended again, despite mm. the fact he promised explicitly there'd be no more extensions to March the 1st and March the 8th because they're doing this ladder thing. Yes. They're doing it in two stages. Uh, it was a 314 to 108 vote, but that was 207 Democrats and 107 mm. Republicans. Yes. So if you do the maths here, that means 108 Republicans against mm. to 107 Republicans for. So he actually lost the Republicans. Uh, and it wasn't wasn't super comfortable because they need two-thirds of the floor vote because Republicans wouldn't let Johnson push it through a normal committee. Mm. And they, they got there with about 20 votes to spare. But, yeah, all Democrat votes. Yes. Anyway, and now Tim Burchett is saying things like this. If Speaker Johnson doesn't deliver on the conservative credentials that he promised us, then, then I suspect we will be looking for a new speaker. I, that's, that's always an option. And Marjorie Taylor Greene is, unsurprisingly, openly campaigning for Speaker now on Steve <laughs> Bannon's show. If I'm Speaker of the House, I finish the job in the House. I pass the appropriation bills. And then I tell Chuck Schumer in the Senate, it's your job now, buddy. You do your work. And then we'll talk. But right now, Mike Johnson is getting rolled in meeting after meeting after meeting. If I was Mike Johnson, I'd just hand her the speakership. Go for it, Marjorie. <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean she's given up on vice presidential ambitions? I, 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 well, I don't think this, the fact she's, she's campaigned for speaker means that she's given up because yeah, yeah. You know, she could have two roles at once. <laughs> but, um, she could. Um, but, uh, I mean, I think most people now think it's between Stefanik and Kirsty Nowen. Mm. But uh, although Tim Scott seems to think he's still in the race, well, he's yes. been working. We'll get to that. We'll get yes, to that. He's yeah. working real hard. <laughs> uh, but, um, anyway, the final point on all this is yes. that for the remember I said before that they've already lost Marjorie Taylor Greene in any budget vote. Mm. House Republicans now can only afford to lose one. Vote. I was going to ask, what's it down to? It's down to one. Yeah, because uh, it's nominally a two nineteen to two thirteen advantage. Yes, with there's been uh, that's with three vacancies, which yep. is Santos, McCarthy, and Bill Johnson has just re- resigned yep. as well. Santos's seat's going to be filled in late February. Yes, McCarthy's in May, and Johnson's in June. Yep, so they're to come. Yes. But also, Hal Rogers is recovering from a car crash. Yes, I saw that. And Steve Scalise is bat- battling blood cancer. Yeah, at the moment. Yeah, yeah. He's getting some hardcore treatment. So for the next month, yes. it's 217 to 213, and there are no ties in the House. Mm. So if they lose two votes, it's 215 to 215, they lose the vote. Yeah. So they can only afford to lose one person. <laughs> Who <laughs> they've already lost. Who they've already lost. Yeah. So it's pretty tense for Mike Johnson for the next month. Wow. We'll see. That's the update. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, another update uh, on Ackman. An Ackman update. The, <laughs> Bill Ackman, the, 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 the most important topic of last week's okay. show. Look, this is going to be very quick. Yeah. We, we spent way too long talking about, talking about Bill Ackman, the, yes. the billionaire jag off yeah. uh, okay. slash Twitter philosopher yes, last yeah, week. Yep. Um, this is going to be quick. Yes. First of all, I just have just saw two things which are of note. Yep. Number one, why Bill Ackman doesn't seem to be a huge Joe Biden fan. This is a pretty funny story. This is a, a Fox Business story that was I was pointed to from 2017. They're at some dinner back in 2017 mm-hmm. with lots of business people and politicians. And yep. Jeb Bush asked Joe Biden, why didn't you run in 2016? And Biden explained that part of the decision stemmed from the death of his son, Bo Biden. We've heard this before. Mm. Who died of brain cancer in 2015. The room grew quiet as Biden became emotional. You can imagine how this would happen. Yeah. And said, I'm sorry. I've said enough. That's when Ackman blurted out, why? That's never stopped you before. The formal and understated dinner conversation suddenly turned tense, according to three people who were present, and confirmed both the substance and wording of Biden's responses. Biden, these people say, turned to someone seated near him and asked, Who is this asshole? <laughs> A reference to Ackman. Then he turned directly to Ackman and started and stated, Look, I don't know who you are, wise ass, but never disrespect the memory of my dead son. These <laughs> Ackman attempted what was described as apology, to which Biden said, just shut the hell up. 
That was good advice from uh, from, from Biden. <laughs> that was there. yes. Shame he didn't take it, and that uh, leads me to point two. Yeah, which is uh, and the Atlantic ran one of the greatest hit pieces yep. I've ever read on Bill Ackman. Oh, fantastic! Absolutely out of control tweeting and self regard. Okay, I have. It's so magnificent. I've I've taken out a gift link for you guys. Oh, great! So go to the show notes. The gift link is there. It's good for a month. Okay. So if you're listening to the next month, you'll be able to go there and read it free. <laughs> I recommend it. It's very satisfying stuff. It's a real, it's a really bitchy hit piece. Okay, <laughs> so it's, uh, I'm in. So anyway, so that's my update on Aquin. A very important a- update. Right. Okay. Enough updates, Dave. Start us off on R.I.P. DeSantis. Yeah. So, what went wrong? Mm. Um, it was doomed from the beginning. I think is the answer to that. Right. Yeah. As in, as in, even before the indictments, right from the start. Yep. Go yes, on. and I think that the charismatic power of Trump has been reaffirmed. Mm. The, the question was, had that actually been diminished in any way by the, you know, the events of the last two years, including him losing the 2020 election? Mm. Because I'd always thought prior to the 2020 election that if he lost that would actually damage his charismatic power. Hmm. Uh, But it didn't because so many people don't believe that he actually lost that election. In retrospect, I think the fact that that charismatic power is undimmed meant there are probably things that DeSantis could have done or that someone else could have done to make it a closer contest. But actually, I think no one ever had a chance. Hmm. Uh, So maybe DeSantis can take uh, some kind of consolation from that. But let's actually have a look at the specific things that he did wrong. Yes. Um, I continue to maintain that the biggest mistake, and once again, this is very much a hindsight mistake and probably most people wouldn't have advised him any differently. He should have got in the race as soon as Trump did. Yeah. Uh, so Trump, we might remember, got in the race in just before the, uh, the 2022 midterm elections. If you can remember the launch of his campaign... Not a single sitting member of Congress, with the exception of Madison Cawthorn, uh, showed up to that. Ivanka didn't show up to it. Ivanka didn't show mm. up to it. He was so bereft of his usual kind of elite supporters that Gina Reinhart was one of the guests. Uh, like, that's the bottom of the barrel that he was at mm. uh, at that point. Then within a week, there was the results of the 2022 midterm elections, which, uh, you know, given that Republicans did win the House of Representatives, you can't call it a total loss, but it was way below expectations. And in particular, Trump's picks all lost. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So Republicans were treating it like a loss. Mm. And, you know, Democrats holding on to the Senate as, uh, you know, as well. Um, And if we remember... There were two main reasons that everybody was uh, talking about. One was abortion. The other one was Trump. Yeah. Um, and that was, you know, the the abortion thing is something that people knew was going to be a factor. Uh, the Trump one was perhaps something that people didn't see coming. Mm. Uh, Frank Luntz notoriously said that the, you know, the thing that voters were most concerned about was inflation. Second thing they were most concerned about was crime. Third thing they were most concerned about was uh, immigration and, like, mm. Trump was 10th on the list. No, mm. it turned out Trump was, like, number two or three mm. uh, on on the mm. list for voters. And, um, uh, yeah, uh, and the fact that abortion along with, you know, was was – being taken um, by more people as their first choice issue than inflation was the sign that Republicans were doomed. Okay, so we've got to remember Trump was in a very bad condition or at at least appeared to be in a very Mm. bad uh, condition back in October. Now, as I said, the reality of it is his charismatic power over the base was undimmed. What was going on back then was that people weren't paying a huge amount of attention to the base. That's the point of the electoral cycle Mm. where the emphasis is instead on the elite supporters. If DeSantis or anyone else was ever going to have a chance, it would have had to have been at that point really getting all of those elites on board and just having an extremely concerted effort to try to push Trump out. Mm. It probably would have failed, Mm. but it would have been more effective than what actually happened. Instead, what happened, and I think it wasn't even just the indictments, 
It was the fact that there were no Trump opponents to be seen anywhere for months. Mm. Uh, DeSantis, Haley, none of them wanted to alienate. You know, all of them thought that they were in with a chance, but they knew that they would need to get Trump's supporters. Whether they were hoping that Trump would just kind of fall over off his own accord uh, or, you know, would have, would have fallen out of favour, they didn't want to actually alienate his supporters. What that effectively meant was that between about October and May, there was no contest and the field was left entirely to Trump. Yes, the indictments helped Trump definitely because they basically forced Republicans to rally around him. But the other thing was he just had the field to himself mm. for months. He had months and months to consolidate his uh, his support with not only with no one attacking him, no one opposing him, no yeah. one like no one anywhere near. And like yes, by the standard calendar of the primaries, you don't really need to get involved until the middle of the year. And I'm sure that there were people advising DeSantis, you know, stay above the fray, keep your powder dry. Um, the Florida was having this special session of the legislature where that was where he was going to have all of these uh, colossal conservative policy achievements that he was going to tout. I can see what the strategy was. Mm. In retrospect, the strategy uh, was one of the things that doomed him. Yeah, they, they allowed... Yeah. Rather than pushing Trump when he was off balance, yes. they allowed him to gather his feet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They gave him the time yes. to, to, to steady. Yes, yeah, yeah. Mm. So um, that was a mistake, and that wasn't just DeSantis' mistake. No. That was that was everybody's mistake. But DeSantis, mm. as as the front runner, as the only one who actually could have mobilised, mm. um, you know, elites. Uh, you know, and you've got to remember, these are at times where there were polls showing them neck and neck in Florida, DeSantis mm. ahead in New Hampshire, mm. like they're, you know... Um, as I said, people weren't really paying that much attention to the base at that point, but if there was ever a time, it was going to be then. Okay, so that I think is the biggest strategic misstep. The, the Another major strategic misstep was the whole way that DeSantis' campaign was organised, which was just an absolute money suck, mm. um, including... Paying, you know, basically paying everyone who was who was working on the campaign. This was not an army of highly motivated volunteers. He was paying people to knock on doors. Mm. That's a good way to spend a lot of money just to piss people off, mm. uh, which is one of the things that his uh, his campaign did. Um, DeSantis has, of course, Bloomberg and Giuliani to thank for the fact that he's never going to get anywhere near the records for most money wasted on a primary <laughs> campaign. But this was a colossally wasteful campaign. Uh, can, I, can I just pick yes. up from there as well? Yeah, yeah. There was actually a corollary to that as well, which yeah, was yeah. they spent so much money early Yes, yeah. that when they retooled, yes. that when they realised they were in trouble, yeah, which yeah. they realised pretty quickly, yes. I think about August, they realised they were in trouble. Yeah, yeah. When they retooled, that at that point in time, they discovered he wasn't raising as much money as he used to. No, and so he was kind of on the. He wasn't broke, but he yeah. he, he all of a sudden was what he had while he was a main candidate. He had the budget of yes. a lower rung candidate at that point in yes. time. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they were forced to let his super PAC do yes. a lot of work. His super PAC still had lots of money. Yeah, they had yeah like yeah. two hundred million bucks or whatever, right? So they had to force they had to do a get. They had to apportion a lot of the normal candidate work yes. to the super PAC. That's absolutely right. Which is, number one, illegal. Yes. <laughs> and number so that is a problem. And yeah, number yeah. two, it's a, a, it's a recipe for chaos because yes. then you've got two yep. heads of the campaign. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And they not, they're legally not allowed to talk to each other. Yes. So it's the mm. most super PAC heavy mm. campaign that certainly that I've ever seen. Mm. At the same time, the actual campaign – was basically DeSantis's uh, trusted capos from uh, Tallahassee, mm. but because he trusts so few people, none of them had very much experience mm. either. Like in his time as governor, his whole trusted circle has uh, has turned over. So mm. it was the blind leading the blind as far as the actual campaign, mm. uh, yeah, went. And um, also, he just—I mean, it didn't help that he was backed by these supremely overconfident rich people who think that if they throw enough money at anything, they can get their way, mm. right? It's very much Elon Musk mindset is, mm. uh, you know, is, is who was backing him. Um, and, yeah, then, of course, he had the uh, campaign launch on Twitter, which 
Sorry, and just to be clear, yeah, yeah. when you talk about those very rich people, yes. they can only donate to the super PAC. That's right, yes. Because there's a limit on when yes. they can donate yeah, yeah, to the Yeah, Canada. yeah, yeah, So once again, that only strengthened the super PAC. Yes, yeah. And, and yeah, yeah, and none of them actually had any good ideas. Mm-hmm. None of them were actually working together. It was just a bunch of rich people, uh, you know, saying, let's try this incredibly expensive idea. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. It's, the, not, it's not the launch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the structure of the campaign mm-hmm. was, uh, you know, was, was just bad. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of the, uh, in in retrospect as well, um, DeSantis's political abilities were just wildly overestimated, mm. and this comes back to the problem that I mentioned quite a bit on Pep, which is just because someone runs a successful gubernatorial campaign, just because someone is a popular governor, mm. that does not usually translate into national popularity. It does sometimes. You've got the occasional Bill Clinton. Uh, but, you know, as I've said before, the the norm is far closer to someone like Scott Walker or Sarah Palin. Uh, someone can be a very popular governor in, or at least a very successful governor in their home state and just have very little appeal outside it. And that was DeSantis. I've forgotten who I heard this from. I think it might be on the Dispatch podcast. I yeah. won't give credit, but I just don't remember the person. Yeah. Uh, someone made the point, I think this is true, that yeah. what people look for in governors yes. is different to what they look for Very in presidents. Very different, yes. In governors, yeah, yeah. they're looking for pragmatic ability. Yes. Ability to just basically be a manager. Yeah, yeah. In president, they're looking for inspiration. Mm. And so what makes a what makes a popular governor yes, is, not, yeah. is almost the opposite of what makes a popular presidential candidate. Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 So um, then there was the problem that... DeSantis's campaign, by the time it actually began, was actually about a a, a year to eighteen months out of sync with public opinion. Mm. Uh, so it's easy to forget now, but his big thing was going to be his COVID response. Yes. That was actually going to be the absolute heart of his campaign. His uh, his idea that the way that he ran Florida during the pandemic is that's how the whole country wanted to be. Like Make America Florida was a serious kind of, yeah. uh, you know, became a bit of a joke by the end. But it was actually, there, there was going to be a serious uh, kind of, we, if we can make the rest of America more like Florida, then uh, America is going to be a better place. Um, the problem was that by the time that the actual campaign began, nobody wanted to think about COVID. Mm. No, no one cared anymore. Mm. And as I've said before, if you look at so four governors who got re-elected in 2022 with huge margins, so DeSantis is one of them, a Republican who had a relatively laissez-faire approach. Um, Jared, your man Jared Polis, yeah, is another one, Dem- a Democrat who had a relatively yeah. laissez-faire a Democrat yep. whose approach looked a lot yeah. like uh, DeSantis's. Mm-hmm. So he got elected with uh, with by 16 percent margin, which yep. is huge. Yep. But then on the other side of the ledger, you've got Gretchen Whitmer yep. uh, in a very close state who gets elected by 12% as a Democrat with the opposite approach yep. to DeSantis. And then you've got you've got the governor of Ohio, Mike DeWine, a Republican who had the opposite approach yes. to DeSantis, getting yeah. elected with a 27-point margin, yes. which is one of the most staggering achievements of that whole cycle. Doesn't mm. Probably doesn't get talked about mm. as much as it should. But the, the point is... You can't read anything uh, into the national mood from the way that governors were getting re-elected willy-nilly uh, on the back of their COVID responses. Uh, everyone live what their own governor was doing, it, it turns out. Now, so it was always, and, and that was going to be a major part of the uh, campaign. To his credit, he did realise fairly quickly that nobody wanted to hear uh, about his um, about his COVID response. But... Even his culture war issues had gone yeah. pretty stale. I was going to say he tried to replace it with yes. with woke the war on woke. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where Florida, where woke goes to die. Yes, yeah, and yeah. And unfortunately for him, that was very 2021, 2022. It was. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. People were just sick of the word. People were mm. sick of hearing about it. Some of his mighty victories had already lost a considerable amount of shine mm. by that point. He was outwitted by Disney, much to the hilarity mm. of uh, of of everybody. Mm. Um, the, the anti-trans stuff hadn't actually proven to be a particularly effective um, uh, electoral issue. Um, 
So, yeah, and, uh, you know, people had forgotten what critical race theory was by that point. Even Rufo's moved on to, uh, you know, to other issues now to try to maintain his relevance. Um, so it was ju- it was really out of sync mm-hmm. with uh, what was what was going on. And people don't like to be reminded of things that they were recently into but are not into anymore. <laughs> Um, So that was, you know, so all of this comes into the category of missteps, mistakes, but there are just some things that DeSantis could do nothing about and one of them was that he was the least charismatic candidate I've ever seen. Yeah. The, The absolute least. And if you look at everybody who has become president so in my lifetime so this is for, well I, I was actually born during the Carter presidency but that was only for a few months uh basically Reagan onwards uh everybody from Reagan onwards had either a lot of personal magnetism a lot of gravitas or a lot of magic with large crowds mm. now I don't know if anybody had all three of those things but all of them had at least one. Mm. of those things. So Trump and Obama, they both had the magic with large crowds. Um, Clinton had, and Reagan, huge amount of personal magnetism. George H.W. Bush, gravitas. Joe Biden, actually. Uh, I mean, he, I think he's lost a little bit of it, but but gravitas mm. was mm. Uh, was one of the things that he brought to the table. He also is actually pretty personally um, magnetic in small settings. He's not he's not big with uh, large crowds, right? All of them have one, two of these things. I'm not sure if anybody really had all three. Mm. Um, DeSantis had none of them, mm. right? As we discussed earlier, DeSantis's specialty was holding these press conferences where he's flanked by aides who look like bodyguards and he just <laughs> screams abuse at the media. Yes, that is his specialty. Yeah. Now, it's as if he's... Designing a campaign specifically for Australian Sky News After Dark, right? This this is his fan base. They they loved it. They thought that he was the best thing ever. Uh, you know, if Rowan Dean had been able to vote in the Republican primary, well, that at least would have been one vote for uh, you know for DeSantis. But um, you're right, actually. He's like yeah. this is when you know you're you're too online. I'm going to go through yeah, some yeah, things yeah. as well. And one of the things I'm going to say is that he was too online. Yeah. All his most hardcore supporters yeah. were not American citizens. Yes, exactly. Like, yes, like Ian Miles Chong, the the, yes. dude, the, the weird yeah, guy yeah. on Twitter from Malaysia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they love him. Yes. Like it's not Americans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Anyway, I mean, on. I suppose Musk is American now, but yeah, <laughs> like he's. he's it, and anyway. Musk moved to Ramaswamy. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's, so his base is largely non-voting people, which is yeah, never never what you want. Um, and yeah, it was it was that's something that you can't learn. I feel. Mm. Uh, and it wasn't something that he could repair. There was a lot of talk about it a, a few months ago about how increasingly his wife was uh, was becoming the face of the campaign. Mm. Uh, that was not a good sign, mm. right? That, that was a sign that they understood that he was personally uh, turning people off. So... I look. I won't say that this is the greatest mismatch between expectations and results ever, because there have been bigger mismatches than this. But this was a significant mismatch between mm. expectations and results. Um, but it was a campaign where essentially everything went wrong. Okay. Uh, look, there's a there's a few things that I agree with, and there's a few yep. things I want to add. Yes. I don't disagree with anything you said. Mm. Um, the I particularly want to endorse. Yep. That the problem was him. Yes. Like there's, there is some rev- – the conventional wisdom right now is not that. Mm. The conventional wisdom right now is that the indictments kill them. No. That's the conventional wisdom. And that's been informed by uh, some some people pointing to polls. Well, I think it was April 3 when the first indictment hit. Yeah, yeah. And Trump got this huge spike, like his 10-point mm. spike in polls. He ne- hasn't looked back since then. Mm. That's true. Mm. But – that's when you're looking at Trump's line. Look yes. at DeSantis' yeah, line. that's right. DeSantis' line is a straight line mm. with even gradient that peaked at the beginning of the year. Yes. Just after the midterms mm. and has gone down ever since. Yep. Straight line. There has been no no accelerations or decelerations. Just as people get to know him, they don't like him. Like they liked him when they didn't know who he was, <laughs> and the more they got to know him, the less they liked him. Yeah, I yeah. think I think the problem is him. 
Yeah. Like that's the first thing which I which I very much agree with you. I think the data shows that. Yes. Um the and the but I would add to that. I don't think my personal view is I don't think his his lack of charisma is mm. actually his biggest problem. Really? I'm not saying it's great. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm not mm. saying you want a lack of charisma. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that's his problem. I think now of all times yes. when people so have so many problems with the people in charge. Yeah. You could get away with just being a competent, normal person. Mm. I think you could get if you're up against Obama, you can't get away with that. Yes, yeah. But against these two, mm. I reckon you could get away yes, with yeah, that. Yeah. Right. But the problem with him, I think, is a big problem is he's too programmed. Mm. Way too programmed. Yeah. I think that the that I think if you look at the way he dealt with the the uh, the indictments is a great example. Like the, the his very first response, and, yeah. the, and there was such an important response. His mm. first response to the first indictment was, I've got the quote right here. Actually, it was he said something like, uh, uh, "I don't know what goes into paying hush money to a porn star to secure silence over some type of alleged affair. I just, I just can't speak to that." He said, and then he went straight into talking about the weaponization mm. of the of the the prosecution. So he was having he was having a bit each way. He was like he just wasn't committing. No. He wasn't committing to either criticizing Trump or or defending Trump or like he just didn't yeah. have a line. It just and it, and I thought that was such a great example of what he did all the time. Mm. It's like Ukraine. Yeah, he wouldn't say let's fund it, let's not fund it. He mm. was saying. I don't think we should fund it until Europe does their bit, which yeah, was yeah. always bullshit because Europe was always doing yes. their bit. But the but it was just classic DeSantis to yeah. hedge and hedge. Like he, the, everything he said was so rehearsed mm. and so yeah, yeah. designed to not offend, mm. to yeah. try to to try to keep everyone happy. Yes, you can't keep everyone happy. No. You've got to make some choices. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he was re- and his campaign was refusing to make choices. Yes, yeah, yeah. And when he's up against Trump, yeah, who for all his flaws. He's always all in. Mm. Wherever, yeah, yeah, yeah. wherever he commits to, he rarely yeah. commits to, at least for that day. Yeah, yeah. And then he'll commit to something else. But you you never get the sense that he's holding back. No, no. With DeSantis, you always got the sense that he was holding back. Yeah. He came off as extraordinarily inauthentic to me. Yes, yeah, yeah. Now, if you take someone like, say, Richard Nixon, mm. who was a guy who also had zero charisma. Yes. And when he first started off, he was incredibly unsuccessful. Mm. And then when he came back, he just embraced the fact that he wasn't an inspirational politician. Mm. And he just he he just tried to be the the voice of the everyman, yes, essentially. Yeah, yeah. He pulled it off. Mm. I think that's what DeSantis should have done. I think yeah. DeSantis has Nixon-like qualities. In fact, in a lot of ways, I think he has Nixon-like qualities. No, I disagree. Yeah, uh, uh, go on. Um, uh, I think Nixon harboured these really genuine resentments mm. of the East Coast elite. So he hadn't been, uh, he had not been able to go to. Um, Harvard because of his financial circumstances. Mm. So he went to Whittier College uh, instead in California. Then he ended up going to Duke Law School. Um, In those days, the East-West geographic divide was a really serious one um, when when Nixon's political career started. Like California was not the juggernaut that it is today. Uh, It didn't have professional sports teams until the 1950s. The media was all based in the East. Uh, there was a real, there was a geographical resentment there. Um, as And also California, especially Southern California, where Nixon came from, was very right wing. Mm. It was uh, made up, largely made up of white Midwestern uh, right wing emigres. And, um, and, you know, N- Nixon came from an odd background in all kinds of ways. He was a Quaker. Mm. Um, he was one of the least financially successful members of, uh, of Congress, which was something he had to use, he learnt to use to his advantage. Mm. He, he admitted to humiliating things like the fact that he was still financially dependent on his parents well, mm. into, uh, well into adulthood. Mm. Um, when he was accused of taking improper campaign donations in 1952, when he was Eisenhower's vice presidential candidate, which pissed Eisenhower off so much that he wanted Nixon to resign on television. Instead, Nixon goes on television and says, oh, well, my wife doesn't have a mink coat. Uh, And, you know, look, there's one donation we're not giving back. One of our donors sent a puppy 
who's black and white. My daughter called him checkers and God damn it, we're not giving checkers up. Now, that was completely fabricated. Like, yes, there was a dog called checkers, but no one was suggesting yeah. that he should send the, the dog back. Now, Nick, the way that Nixon was able to mobilise these resentments really actually resonated with people, partly because that actually was authentic. DeSantis doesn't have those authentic resentments. DeSantis is a product of Yale Law School. Yep. Um, uh, you know, De- DeSantis is he is your very typical 2010s, 2020s populist, which is he's he he is actually part of that elite. Mm. He's uh he's he's you know, he's in a minority in that elite, but he is actually part of that elite and he can't really pretend to be anything otherwise. When he is um you know, when he's firing off about his resentments, he's doing it in a completely different political landscape. He's doing it in a landscape that has had Fox News for the last 30 yeah. years. Uh, he's he's doing it in a landscape where this is a pretty well-established repertoire and he didn't really stand out in any distinctive way from thousands of other people who are doing the same shit. That's a, that's a good response because you're responding to something that I hadn't even said yet, ah. but yet... It actually responds to it. Okay. <laughs> In that, what I was going to say yes. was that the when the Nixon like qualities I was referring to yes. was that I think he I think he is a very intelligent person, yes. like Richard Nixon, oh, yeah, was a yeah, very yeah. intelligent person. Yeah. I also think that he has an complete inability to bond on a human level with anyone. Yes, absolutely. Like Richard Nixon didn't. Yes. And I think that the way he bonds with people is through shared resentment. Yes. And like and so, and so, <laughs> yeah. and so that's what I was about to say. And then you you have now rebutted that in advance mm. by saying yes, but his resentments yes. aren't, aren't authentic in the way that Richard Nixon's were. By the way, I'm pretty sure that we've put uh, Nixon Land on the reading list by Rick Perlstein, which is I e- everything I said just came from uh, Nixon Land. Sure. But if if not, we definitely read it. Well, yeah. look, I might be right, might be wrong, but that that was my take. That yep. He needs to be a bit more Nixon. <laughs> At the very least, he needs to be a bit more authentic. Yeah. And, I, and but the only thing is, is Nixon, Nixon also though he had gravitas. Mm. DeSantis doesn't have it. He's never had it. No one has. No one has as much gravitas now as they did fifty years ago. <laughs> The whole world doesn't have gravitas. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm a commentator on TV. Yeah. <laughs> like 50 years ago, there's absolutely no way I was going anywhere yeah. near TV. <laughs> I mean, come the, on. Other, the other thing is uh, Nixon actually had the advantage of his political debut mm. was national. Mm. His political debut was basically it was in, in Congress as basically the prosecutorial face mm of anti-communism mm. uh, going after people like Al Uh Now, that gave him a national profile and that did, first of all, it established as, him as somebody very serious. Second, it established him as what was famously referred to as an old person's idea of a young person. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, uh, like yeah. he got this fan base mm. of, uh, of elderly people mm. um, and, who saw him as the future. Mm. Um, yeah, so th- these are these are all advantages that DeSantis could not claim because he started out at the state level. Fair enough, fair enough. We, 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 we will see if he has a comeback. <laughs> like no, that that remains to be seen. He won't. Even oh. though there are a few things I confidently predict, yeah. my prediction would be if he comes back in 2028, he's looking at the kind of uh, Santorum 2016 type sure. uh, campaign. Okay. Uh, just, just to... Just to uh, fluff out a little bit while I'm talking about the authenticity, I yes. think if we look at his his um, concession, yeah, I think it just sums up perfectly the problem with with his persona and his yes. delivery. Yeah. And, uh, by the way, I, I liked. I want to give him credit for, for and I, I think he deserves credit for for dropping out the first moment. Yeah. Yeah. That that he could reasonably say there is no path. Yes, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, until that moment, until Iowa, there was a path. Yeah. It's unlikely it seemed there was a path. Yeah, yeah. The moment Iowa happened, there was no path. And yes. like two days later, he's out. Yeah. So I'll give him credit for that. Yeah. Uh, and, but, and this is how, this is how, this is one of the things he said in his speech. Yeah. Now, following our second place finish in Iowa, we've prayed and deliberated on the way forward. If there was anything I could do to produce a favorable outcome, more campaign stops, more interviews, I would do it. But I can't ask our supporters to volunteer their time and donate their resources if we don't have a clear path to victory. Accordingly, I am today suspending my campaign. I'm proud to have delivered on 100% of my promises, and I will not stop now. That's that's a nice thing to that's say. That's pretty unobjectionable. That, yeah, and that's pretty cool. But that's, the reason I highlight that yeah. is because... Uh, apart from the weird puffy thing he's got going on, I don't know if he's mm. been crying for the last three days, but yeah. the... Uh, but the I want to highlight because of 
the mismatch between his tone and what he's talking about. Yeah. If you watch the whole speech, it's all like that. He's talking about yeah. He's talking about how the, the entire race is over, everything's fucked. Yeah. But he's doing this really chipper voice <laughs> the whole time. Like really, really hopeful and optimistic about how everything's fucked. Yeah, like it's just it's it's like it's just like everything's shit. Yeah, my world's crashing down around me. I'm gonna curl up in the fetal position. <laughs> like while being happy. He just he doesn't He's got no authenticity in his yeah, delivery yeah. whatsoever. Yes. And like and just and he needed to not be like that when he's up against Trump yeah. of all people. So the uh so I think that was a huge problem for him. Like people just aren't going to trust him. So, just- but, among other things I'm reminded of like <laughs> when, when I used to watch uh Rage on Saturday nights starting <laughs> at midnight. It's a video that you'd often see was <laughs> Everything's Fucked by the Dirty 3. <laughs> it's great. I hadn't thought about that uh <laughs> for many years, but fantastic uh clip. I'd love to see the Sands perform that. Yes. Well, yeah. it's it's a non-vocal uh <laughs> tr- violin track. Sure. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> so probably not, but uh, the, by the way, I'm not sure if you saw this. The funniest bit I did say this on the show, but anyway, yeah. the funniest bit of his dropout was his tweet. Did you see the tweet? No. Okay, so this this was I, mean, I don't see many tweets. Okay, the these video days. came out in the form of a tweet, but yes. there was a caption for the tweet. Yeah. And it was quote a quote yeah. from Winston Churchill. Oh. Success is not final, failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. Does not sound like Churchill. Very inspirational, but you are, your instincts are correct. <laughs> but it's not actually Churchill. I'll tell you, people went looking for, for who has said that, and it wasn't Winston Churchill. It's, yeah, yeah. It's a very commonly misquote. Yeah. Uh, it's a com- very common misquote from Winston Churchill. Yes. For those on the internet, because the Sands campaign's always been too <laughs> online. Uh, but someone did find who did say it. Yes. And yeah, it was yeah. a 1938 Budweiser commercial. <laughs> So Bud got their revenge on DeSantis because Bud is one of the people that DeSantis has taken on in his war against woke because, yeah, because, wow. because Dylan Mulvaney, a trans, a trans woman, uh, yeah, yeah, didn't yeah. have the Bud Light and DeSantis didn't like that. That, so. is, that is awesome. <laughs> By the way, uh, if you're ever in uh, London, I highly recommend the Churchill War Rooms. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is the museum of what Churchill did and how he actually lived during the Second World War. The thing about Churchill is that he's one of these figures where there have been so many biographies. He's kind of so universally, or well, maybe not universally acclaimed, but like you know, so acclaimed that he's just always sort of awash in people's um, projections mm. of him. Where the the real Churchill is actually a lot more interesting. Uh, in both good and bad ways than than any of that. Um, but uh, one of the interesting things about the Churchill War Rooms is that he wanted a garment that he could just wear comfortably underground. And so they someone designed this green velvet onesie for him. And I'm no uh, fashion historian, so I'm not sure if this is true, but I think that was basically where the onesie was invented. Now, the, the one is probably one of these things that, you know, was never invented by one specific person, but I think it may have been, like, he may have been one of the first people to, to at least the most famous person to to really wear it. So not, not only did he look kind of like a baby, he was actually dressed like a baby as he was heroically leading the democratic world. Um, against Nazi Germany during, you know, the darkest hours of the 20th century. Am I going to find a 1937 Budweiser commercial with a onesie (laughs) guy? Is this what I'm going to find? No, no, you're not. (laughs) No, this was, I I have seen this one, this this giant, it's like the size of a parachute or something. Yeah, Uh, yeah, this this green velvet onesie, he called it, what was he called it his... He had a name for it. He did. It yeah. was his something suit. Like, yeah, this <laughs> sort of frivolous, uh, frivolous, because he, he wanted to be comfortable. So he would change into His the, Riddler suit? It was yeah. a green onesie? <laughs> <laughs> he would change into the... And he, re- and he really was drinking a lot, though not not quite as much as has been uh, claimed. But he sure. was he was he was pretty well lubricated. Okay. <laughs> uh, during that period. Uh, fair enough. Um, look, we've, we've talked a lot about DeSantis. I, 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 I will yeah. just always draw your attention to a... There's always some funny postmortems when, right, when, yes. they, when yeah, a, yeah, yeah. a campaign crashes down. Yeah, and um, I, I'll put one in the show notes from the NBC, okay. NBC News. They got a few few things they talk about. Mm. One thing which they really focused on, which yeah. they use as a metaphor 
yep. for his whole campaign was mm. for the chaos of his campaign. Yes, was that the never back down CEO Scott Wagner apparently spent many hours in the week before the Iowa caucus doing a jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> like in, in campaign headquarters, yeah, a thousand piece jigsaw okay. puzzle. Right, not a metaphorical jigsaw puzzle no. trying to put together no. a winning campaign. No, he was just doing a jigsaw puzzle. Wow. And there's photos of it. They got a photo in the in the article. <laughs> and um and in a in a comment to NBC News, Wagner noted that, quote, the office puzzle was there when we arrived and became a sense of pride for the entire team and everyone chipped in a few minutes apiece to get it done. Sure, Scott, we believe you. The fact that everyone's dissing you for this jigsaw puzzle. and Yeah, they're all in on it. Sure. Um, I'm actually going to defend him, though. What was the jigsaw puzzle? It was of the landscape. Right. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to defend him because, look, I, I don't I haven't run a campaign myself, but yeah. I imagine when you get close to the closer you get to the election, the less you can do. Yeah, yeah. The more people out in the field yes. and you're just sitting around waiting. Yeah. So I think if you're going to be waiting around, mm. I'd prefer you to do a jigsaw than to be on Twitter like the rest of That's I, true, I think yes. the Sanders' campaign Very was enough true. on Twitter. Yeah. So, it's, um, so yeah, so, and also, you know, some people relax that way. Yeah. And like, I mean, I, I, I relax relaxed. that way. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I, I totally get that. Yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah. So, I'm, so you and me, Scott. Let's make unsuccessful presidential campaigns together. <laughs> I know you're a pepper. <laughs> let's get on to it. Uh, there was also another anecdote about him being too online. By yeah. the way, you mentioned the opening, the launch on Twitter, which was complete failure. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. another example of them being too online. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Uh, well, well, there's a quote here from yeah, one yeah. advisor about their launch. Mm. Quote: When they decided to do the Twitter Spaces launch, maybe then at that point I knew they were stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it was a funny quote. But yeah. then there was a story about when they had a meeting with a whole bunch of the mm. supporters. Yes, and yeah. The, 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 the team. Yeah, yeah. One of them was Bill Mitchell. You might recall that really stupid person on Twitter. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he's a, he's a big yes. fan supporter. And he was part of it. And one staffer said, another quote, Yeah. Bill Mitchell cut me off. I'll remember this to my dying day and asked the top people on the campaign if they could call Elon Musk and ask him why, why I am being shadow banned. <laughs> that was the level of people we were working with. It was just kind of embarrassing at that point. <laughs> so, yeah. So that that's funny as well. The whole thing by that point had a bit of a fire festival vibe to it. It did. It yes. did. Um, so anyway, but it, it, you can look and you can look for more detail on that mm. in the um, in the show notes. But in the, that's in the blurb of uh, YouTube and uh, also on um, Facebook. Facebook, yes. And I'm gonna put it in the. The, the blurb of the, uh, the the podcast as well. Okay. Anyway, uh, that's enough of that. But uh, look, I, I, bottom line, I just think, I think we, we've we all got different things, different yes. focuses, but I think we all agree that he was the problem. He was the problem. Yeah. 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 It, although, as I said, to be fair to him, I'm actually not sure that anyone could have beaten Trump. I agree with that no as well. Done. I agree yeah. with that as well. Okay. The, I, we've structured this very, very poorly where you're going to talk yes. a lot and I'm going to talk a lot. But- New Hampshire. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Talk, talk to us about New Hampshire. So I said last week that I didn't think that Trump was going to be happy with the Iowa result, even though he, you know, the, the big 30-point win or whatever, but it was only 51% of the vote. Uh, if he was disappointed by Iowa, he did conceal it very well. Yeah. He's, Not so New Hampshire. Uh, just before you go on, yes. I mean, that is true. I just, yeah. just, just say... I actually thought that whole week, not just not just mm. not just the Iowa result, but yeah, yeah. when he was on Fox News, the whole week he was the happiest I'd seen him since 2016. He was really, really happy that whole week. And I thought to myself, shit, if he can pull this off for the next year, he's a different person when he's that happy. He, he even he's a much more attractive he campaigner. Even mentioned his family members. <laughs> yes. But anyway, yeah. that didn't last long. No, so no, that on. did not yes. last. That did not last long at all. Yes. Uh, so yeah, he was not making any attempt to hide his disappointment and mm. disgust uh, after the New Hampshire result. Um, the, I think whereas the Iowa results, it was exactly in line with what the polls were doing. The New Hampshire result was actually a little bit off. Mm. Uh, I think the polls had been giving Trump a twenty point win. Yeah. There and you know ends up being what eleven points. Eleven, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. So uh, Haley did actually cut into it uh, quite significantly, which might explain why she had such a spring in her step uh, during the during her concession speech, which was not much of a concession speech. It was <laughs> no. a, oh, fuck it, I'm staying in. Yeah. Um, and I mean, where like I I was wondering how close would she need to get to stay in, given that. 
the South Carolina primary is still a month away. Yeah. So, I mean, that is a long time to hang around. Like, that's a lot of donor money you're going to burn through. That's a lot mm-hmm. of effort that you're asking people to make. Um, but she realises that she, you know, she doesn't have a win- I don't think she... She thinks she's got a winning coalition behind her, mm. but she does realise she's got people who are going to stick with her all mm. the way. Um, and I think that the yeah the New Hampshire result was one of these results that had something really to irritate everybody. <laughs> yes. Um, so there were still a lot of hardcore delusional never-Trumpers in major media outlets who thought that Nikki Haley could or would win. Mm. Like that was, uh, you know, that was never going to happen and, you know, in the end it wasn't really close. Um, So, you know, their illusions were shattered. But at the same time, this was not the knockout blow that Trump imagined himself landing. It didn't put Nikki Haley out of the race. Um, you know, an outsider looking at this uh, wouldn't think, well, Trump is completely steamrolling, you know, the field and he'll be able to consolidate it behind him. Like, no, it actually gave fodder for a lot of think pieces about what Trump's weaknesses are, uh, particularly with college graduates and yeah. with independents. Can, can I just jump in at this moment? Yes. Just, just to make the point. Yes. Even though Nikki Haley did better than the polling. Yeah. I cannot emphasize enough mm. how many advantages she Absolutely. had in New yes. Hampshire. She yes. really did. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like firstly... Yeah. Uh, her appeal is almost entirely to moderate and co- college-educated voters. Exactly, yes, yeah. 46% of the field in the exit polls were registered as undeclared, <laughs> yes. and they voted 64 to 35 for Haley. Yep. Moderates voted 74 to 22 for yes. Haley. New Hampshire, eighth in America for college degrees. So yes. it's a perfect state for her to mm-hmm. begin with. New Hampshire is a moderate, popular governor. Yes. One of the most popular governors mm. in the country yeah, yeah, who yeah. didn't just endorse her, but he practically co-ran with her. Yeah. She was pretty much seeing his lap every single campaign spot. <laughs> like he was all over her trying yes. to get her over the line. Yeah, yeah. Right? He campaigned way better than she did, mm. I should say. It's true. Yeah. Uh, New Hampshire has a culture of defying Iowa. Yes. And so they were set up to defy Iowa there. Yeah. And also going for the moderate alternative, like yes. John McCain, etc. Trump didn't campaign nearly as much as Haley. She yeah, has yeah. camped out in New Hampshire for months. Yes. And Trump was in court almost every single day yeah, yeah. while she was out campaigning. That's true. If she was ever going to do it, this was yeah, the yeah, state. Yeah. So her her shaving eight points off the mar- the yes. polling margin, I don't think is actually that impressive. No, no. It's there very clear on. that she's not going to win mm-hmm. the yeah. Republican primary yeah. But there is something to the idea that New Hampshire has exposed Trump's broader weaknesses. Yes. <coughs> and, okay, maybe he doesn't need college graduates, although I still think it's a um, that on in conservative politics in general around the world, they are being far too quick and optimistic about the idea that they can just lose college graduates and professionals and, you know, the, the kinds of people that their winning coalitions used to rely on and that they can replace them from somewhere else. Mm. There's no evidence yet that anyone's really been able to do that successfully. So, okay, losing college graduates, that's a problem. But for Trump, the big problem is he is clearly not the same candidate with independence now that he was back in 2016. He's the opposite. He's uh, he, yeah, yeah. He, he used to be a candidate of independence exactly. and not for conservatives. Yes. Yeah, now yeah, it's yeah. the opposite. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, in 2016, mm. that was magic because conservatives mm. would vote for him anyway. Yeah. Yeah, they mm-hmm. might, might not have liked him, but they would uh, they would vote for him anyway. Yeah. That's not how independents work. No. <laughs> yeah, so, no. and, you know, given that, like, I don't want to disparage independents here, but um, uh, independents are more drawn to novelty. Mm. Trump is not a novelty anymore. Mm. Uh, he's not going to get, he's, uh, he's not going to have that factor. Just, just about anything except Trump is a novelty at this point. Um, so, you know, I'm not saying that Biden is, <laughs> Biden's uh, not a novelty. No, uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, you know, Trump is not going to get, uh, he, he doesn't have that mm. anymore. And that I think is a huge problem for that. May, that just makes it a lot harder for him mm. um, to uh, yeah to get elected in twenty twenty four. So, and I think on some level he understands this, mm. and that might account for why he was so grumpy mm. in his uh, in his victory speech. Now, much hay has been made of the fact that uh, you know Trump was really annoyed with Haley 
for coming second and then giving a speech that made it sound like she had won. Mm. Uh, now, of course, everyone remembers what happened on the night of the election in 2020 where Trump <laughs> did exactly the same thing a lot more <laughs> egregiously. Yes. Uh, but I suppose the point I'm trying to make is Trump didn't sound as certain of himself as his supporters are trying to make it seem. Mm. Um, I actually think that Trump knows that he's actually a weaker candidate than he looks like mm. uh, at this point. Can, can I go through a couple of exit polls quickly yes, before you we can. continue? Just yes. to, just to il- it illustrates what you're talking about. Yes, yeah. Um, I did mention some of these on the show, but still. Um, amongst those who thought that the economy was good, yes. Haley won 81 to 16. Yep. Not a big surprise there. Yeah, yeah. Interestingly, there were twenty three percent of them, which is more than I would have expected. Yes, in a Republican, in a Republican primary. primary. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, amongst those who said it was not so good, mm. Haley won fifty two to forty five. Mm. Amongst those who said it was poor, yeah. Trump won eighty nine to ten. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, what's interesting about that? Yep. Is that Trump needs people to think the economy is poor mm. to benefit from it? Yes, he doesn't benefit from people saying the economy is not so good. Yes, and that's a problem for him. That is because the economy is good. Yes, the worst he can expect from independents yeah. in ten months' time, yeah, yeah, is for them to say it's not so good. Yes, and they're not voting for him because of that. That's right. And so that's a, that. That was. Part that was one of the main reason, main ways he was planning to win. Yes, by riding people's poor views of the economy. Yes. So and now, and now, and look, we have talked a lot on Pep, and everyone's talked a lot about how the fact that perceptions of the economy are much worse than what the economy yeah. actually is. Although I'm very sympathetic to the view that the way that people experience the economy sure. often actually is a lot worse than it looks on paper. But, but there has been a second. University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment yeah. Report that is going up quite significantly, mm. out, outweighing just that people think that Trump might uh, become president mm. and that that's the cause of the optimism, which is what it appeared to be mm. in December. Mm. No, it's now, I mean, a lot's been made of this is the biggest jumping, two-month jumping consumer sentiment in the last 30 years, yeah. but that was coming from a very low base. But, it was, but, but still the, a big jump. The point is it's getting back to- and two months in a row. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's getting back to something approaching normal. Yes. Uh, is. Which is, you know, the economy is never going to be a winning issue for Biden. Yeah. The question is, is it going to be- like this weight around his exactly. neck. Exactly. Is it an anchor? Yes. And and those results, to me, suggest yeah. it's not going to be an anchor. Yeah. But anyway, but that, that's just, 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 just from one primary. Uh, another interesting area, mm. 42% said that they thought Trump would not be fit for the presidency if he was committed of a, convicted of a crime. Mm. Now, yes, they're all of independence in New Hampshire. Yeah. But still, 42% in the Republican primary. Yes are saying they thought Trump would not be fit for the presidency if he was convicted of a crime. That 42%, many of them can be won over, yeah. even if he's convicted. Yeah, I'm yeah, sure yeah. of that. Yep. But it will only take 10% yeah. for him to lose the election. Yeah, yeah. And so that's a big number, yeah, yeah. I think. And, so, and, yeah. ha- and Haley won them 83 to 13, by the way. Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 Now, um, I just want to go to a theme that we have talked about before, which is that when the focus is on Biden, Mm. Biden looks like he's going to lose. Yes. When the focus is on Trump, it looks like Trump's going to lose. This is my favourite point. Yes. 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 It's a point that you've made before. It's a point that I've made in in different ways. Um, You know, so a a big question, assuming that it is a Trump-Biden rematch, is who is the focus going to be on? Mm. And the the problem for Trump is – if he's in the race, he cannot do anything except to make it about himself. Even if he could. Yeah. He can't avoid the trials. No. The trials are going to make it about him. Yes. But it doesn't matter because he'll make it about him anyway. Yeah, because it, <laughs> this it's not enough for him to win. This has to be redemption for 2020. And by the this way. This has to be what erases 2020 yeah. from history. And by the way, a really important point to make about this yes. is we are about to have the longest general election campaign in history. Yeah, yeah. It's 10 months long. It's yeah. starting now. Aren't people going to be so enthused by the end? But this is the point. People already hate both these yes, people. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So however much they, they're going to focus their hatred on the person whose attention mm, yeah. they're drawn to already. 
Yeah. Multiply that by two or three because of the long election campaign. Yeah, yeah. This is a real problem, I think. Yeah. For Trump, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, like we know, we know Joe Biden can run a basement campaign. <laughs> yes, he can. <laughs> yes. Can Trump? Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. I, I bet his people are going to tell him that as well. He's yeah. got good people. I should just say this, by the way. So actually, let, let me just let me just yeah. finish the the exit poll for a second. Yes, yeah. Because I think his campaign staff are actually are actually quite competent. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And the uh, and I'll talk about them in a second. Yeah. Um. The other exit poll thing I just wanted to say was that mm. in answer to the question, do you think Biden legitimately won in twenty twenty? Uh, no surprise that those who said yes went for Haley 76 22, mm. and those who said no went for Trump 85 13. That's mm. not a surprise. No. The surprise is yep. 46% said Biden legitimately won in 2020. Mm. That's, and uh, 54% didn't. So Trump gets hosed yeah. by those who say Biden legitimately won in 2020. We know the polls. Yes. The majority of Americans say Biden legitimately won in 2020, right? Yes. And that's before the January 6th trial, yes. which is going to shove it in Trump's face mm. for weeks yes, at a yeah, time yeah, yeah. about how he legitimately lost in 2020. Everyone's going to be paying, going to be paying attention to that. Yes. They'll see the evidence. And you know what else they're going to see? They're going to see Trump flipping out because mm. we know he will. Yes. And that's not going to help his case at all. No. In the core of the public opinion I'm talking about. No, no, no. So that's another bad Bad element for Trump, I yeah, think, yeah, yeah. from the exit polls. Yeah, but yeah, but on, on, you're going. And by the way, none of this is to say that uh, that the Trump is doomed. Oh be- no, because oh, no. there are <laughs> so many things that can put the focus back on Biden. Oh, anything that happens in foreign policy, yeah, focus is back on Biden. Israel constantly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, what if the, the, what if no the guarantee economy, the, the economy turns. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. No guarantee that the economy is going to continue yeah. to get good. Absolutely. Um, so they're, they're, what if he has a single age-related issue whatsoever? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like any yeah. health scare, anything at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not predicting the outcome of the election. As I say, what I am suggesting, which we've been suggesting for a while, is the winner is going to be the person who, that the referendum is not about. I'll tell you the other word I haven't mentioned along the yes. same lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ukraine. Yes. That can go so horribly wrong. Yes, yeah, they're, yeah. They're not going to get another cent of funding from America, I'll tell you yes. that. yeah, yeah. That can go so horribly wrong in the next 10 months. Mm. If that becomes a massacre, yeah, yeah. that's got Biden written all over it. Like that's going to be the worst possible attention that he could get. Yes. So it. Uh, I mean, it won't be great for the Ukrainians either. Yeah, yeah. But I'm just saying, like, no. from, a, from an electoral point of view, mm. that's a potential disaster for Biden yeah, as well. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of ways he can get attention. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. Um, I was going to say about, about Trump's people, I thought they ran a really clever campaign in New Hampshire. Oh, okay. Like, in terms of the ad warfare. Right. Like, the ad warfare, like, in actual fact, his ads had way more substance than Nikki Haley's did. Mm. Um, not that they were substantive, but for, 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 for yeah, for political campaigns yeah, yeah, I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah. Like, like you know, they basically did a pincer movement on Haley where they were attacking from the right on immigration and on yeah. the left on social security. Mm, okay. And they made it really, really hard for okay. her to respond. This is one of the social security ads, mm-hmm. to give you an example. Americans were promised a secure retirement. Nikki Haley's plan ends that. Social Security, Medicare, how would you manage the entitlements? We say the rules have changed. We change retirement age to reflect life expectancy. What we do know is 65 is way too low, and we need to increase that. that. Haley's plan cuts Social Security benefits for 82% of Americans. Trump will never let that happen. Mm. That's a very clever, competent line of mm. argument in New Hampshire, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I, they, they know what they're doing. I, and I've, I was listening to, I mean, I've, I've been listening to a few podcasts with David Axelrod recently, and he's got a lot of positive things to say about Trump's people as well, mm. like he's had the experience with a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. And um, one of the things he said, uh, just a little aside, which I th- found interesting, mm. was, um, well, two things from David Axelrod. Number one, on the night, he said, he knew for a fact, because he knows these people, yeah, yeah, that they told Trump to come out on New Hampshire night and just ignore Nikki Haley completely. Right. Just go out and go, thank you, everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Said, now we're moving to the general election campaign. Joe Biden. And yeah. just talk about Joe Biden. And Trump obviously completely ignored that. <laughs> and that would have been great advice had he done yes. that. Yes. It might have been over. One of the, the theme of today's over. episode is no one ever takes good advice. <laughs> That's right. But also the other thing he said yeah. is he his prediction for the general election campaign, and yeah. I reckon he's probably right yeah, yeah. because he seems to know these people. Mm. So I'll just put it out there now. Yes, um, yeah. He said, he said they're going to want to make the election campaign about Kamala Harris. 
Ah, yeah, is that yeah. because because that's a two for one? Yeah, that's yeah. A, that that's Biden's age, and at the same time, yeah. it's a reason for Biden's age. Yes, like yeah. the like the they're gonna try and make they're gonna try and attack her as much as they possibly can as yeah. the person who is actually going to be president. They're yeah, gonna say. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, so look out for that. If I was Joe Biden, I would be I would be putting Kamala Harris out front now. Yeah. Knowing that that kind of thing is, is yeah, yeah, yeah. going to happen, and I'd be putting her out. Doing the most popular things they possibly can, yeah, you know, like student loan stuff or whatever. Yes, you know, whatever. yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, but uh, uh, sorry, do you have any more to say this? No. Okay, well, just a couple of the random things about this. Um, oh, actually, I'll let me ask you a question: mm. Should Haley drop out or not? I mean, because we, we we agree that she's got no no actual path. Oh, not for me to say. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it depends on what she wants to achieve at this point. If if she is purely making a decision on does she have a you know the the chance to win, then yes, she should drop out because she mm. doesn't. But uh, if if part of what she's doing is building her brand mm. uh, in a in a particular direction, then then sure, go for it. Mm. I mean, she's got a constituency behind her. Apparently, I mean the well, the political articles I've read suggest that she doesn't have aspirations beyond this year. Mm. That she that she doesn't want to be have anything to do with Trump. She doesn't want to be VP. She doesn't want to be in the cabinet, and she doesn't want to run in twenty twenty eight. Okay, I don't know if that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. You know, that that's presumably based on behind the scenes conversations with people yeah. who don't want to go public. Right. Yeah. But uh, I don't know. Anyway, with the uh, I mean, she, I mean, if that's the case, she might as well just just go along for the ride. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're not going to lose anything. Um, as you say. As you say, it's a lot of money to spend, but it's not her money. Yeah, and she says she's got the money to go to Super Tuesday, mm. so yeah, um, yeah. That, that may well be correct. Having said that, uh, a, a lot of people might point to South Carolina. South Carolina does have the advantage. I mean, forget that's her home state; that doesn't really yeah. matter. South Carolina does have. In fact, that, that's that's a negative. I'll tell you why. <laughs> South Carolina has the advantage of Democrats being allowed to vote. Yeah, which is so that obviously is going to help her. Yes. Um, although Joe Biden, I think, is going to campaign properly in South Carolina, so yeah. so that they might not vote for her. But having said that, because uh, they might want to vote for Joe Biden, but um, uh, but they but uh, Trump has collected endorsements from everyone yes. in South, literally yeah, every yeah. citizen in South Carolina turned up sometime in yeah. the last week in New Hampshire. He's just got the lot of them: the governors, the senators, the House, yeah, yeah. The, the, everyone. Um, him. Hallie might have some money, but she's not going to have as much money as Trump. He's yes. going to outspend her a lot in yeah, South yeah, Carolina. Yeah. Uh, yeah. By the way, I got very uh, thrown this week when uh, I was trying to explain on ABC Sydney, on Richard Glover's show, mm. party registration. Yes. Richard was like, well, so what's it for? Why should someone have to so, register for, a the, great question, for their party? Richard. And I said, well, yeah, question. yeah. And I said, oh, yeah, no, it, it's so that they can uh, vote in their party's primaries. But in some states, you could still vote in a primary, yeah. even if you're not registered with that party. And I, I think this that was possibly followed by the longest silence I've ever <laughs> experienced <laughs> on right. Like, yeah, it, it it's I'm one not- of these things where if someone just asks you about it in in the most reasonable and basic way. It's not easy to explain. I've never understood. Registrations don't make sense. That's why you can't explain it. It, it would make Wisconsin sense. Wisconsin doesn't have registrations. <laughs> they function perfectly fine. <laughs> Just there's no need for yeah, them. Yeah, no, it's a, it's something I've never. It's and that's even before you get into the the wackiness of like three of the states with the highest Democratic Party registration are Kentucky, West Virginia and Louisiana. None of it makes sense. <laughs> None of it. They should just have an electoral roll. This is just does, one more way that Australia yeah, yeah, is better yeah, than yeah. America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does. <laughs> everything always makes some sense in some way. But not this. No, not in <laughs> not in translatable ways <laughs> necessarily. So it's a historical. I'm artifact. sorry, I couldn't do a better job of that to the ABC Sydney audience. I, don't blame I can't you do an any better job of it to to Pep. So uh, I don't blame yeah. you one bit. It's a garbage. Yeah, it's a garbage rule. Yeah. Um, uh, as well as that, uh, uh, Trump's running uncontested in Nevada before yep. South Carolina, so he'll get lots of positive publicity out of mm. that. Biden's going to be campaigning against Trump for next month. He started the general election yep. campaign already. Yes, we'll talk about that next week. I think. Okay. Um. The uh. But that means the next four weeks, Haley's going to be in also ran. Yeah. In the in the news. Mm. Um. And she's going to be spend. She's going to spend the next four weeks being asked by interviewers when she's going to drop out. Yeah. Yeah. You know how horrible those interviews are. Like Fox Fox and Friends did one with her 
on the morning of New Hampshire. Yeah, yeah. The entire interview was them asking her if she was about to drop out. And, yeah, and she was getting very frustrated. And you go, well, welcome to the next four weeks. Because that's what it's going to be. Yeah. Look, <laughs> Haley doesn't seem like somebody who would go to this effort really to do nothing other than irritate Trump. But she's doing a very good impression oh, of yeah. somebody who is basically just there to irritate yeah. Trump and yeah. to force Trump into, uh, well, not force him, but to, to, to induce Trump to make a lot of unforced errors. I, I'm going to talk about that in, in just in, in one second. Yes. But just before I do, I just want to make one note. Mm. About the the only real downside, potential downside, yeah, about about her running, but I don't think I think it's bluff. Yeah, is Trump as always? Yes, when he feels threatened, he goes he goes dirty. Yeah, he's already he's already tried his luck with birther attacks on her. Yeah, I, do you know what he calls her now on True Social? No, what, what is, it's not really a nickname; it's just a name. Mm. What her name is. Because you know her real name is Nimarata, right? Yes, yeah. Okay, then Nikki's her middle name. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. No. Um, he first started calling her Nimarata. Mm-hmm. Then he started in ver commas. Yeah, yeah. Then he started calling her Nimrada. Now he calls her Nimbra. It's not even close. And like, and just leaving aside whether you call that racist or just a dickhead, mm. I don't really care. Either way, it's not a great idea when people are accusing you of lacking mental fitness. Yes. To, to suggest that you have, that you struggle that much with the with with, with the English language. Yeah. But uh, anyway, but my point is that he's already started down this road. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There is further he can go. I will play you something from his victory speech. This was during okay. his, during his victory speech. Yes. And just a little note to Nikki. She's not going to win. She's not going to win. But if she did, she would be under investigation by those people in 15 minutes. And I could tell you five reasons why already. Not big reasons. A little stuff that she doesn't want to talk about. But she will be under investigation within minutes. A none too subtle threat there from Trump. Wow. (laughs) A few things she doesn't want to talk about. Mm. There's uh, a lot of implicit... uh, Implicit ominous uh, undertone to that, so uh, so yeah, so that's a, a, that is a potential reason she might not want to go forward. I mean, you you I don't know if you even know this that there've been there's been scuttlebutt articles about affairs that she had in South Carolina oh, in right. the last in the last two or three weeks, which I'm sure yeah. were leaked by Trump's people. Mm. Like if he if he wants to go scorched earth, which he might, which if she pisses off him yeah. enough, he might. She might not want that. But Although, I that's, mean, that's the only reason. I, I think it's well, bluff. Th- this shit isn't actually Trump's strength at mm. all. Mm. Remember him reposting some of the weakest shit in the world about <laughs> DeSantis? <laughs> yeah, yes, Suggesting yes. that he was hanging out with yeah. underage yeah. kids. Yeah, like, Plying them with alcohol. Yeah, like <laughs> yes. it just it went absolutely nowhere. I yeah. wouldn't be afraid of that stuff mm. if I were her. But this is what I was teasing about before. Yes. You're saying that she gets under his skin. Yeah. I am of the view that the reason Trump flipped out yeah. during his victory speech and mm. didn't do what his people told him to do yes. was not because he was so offended that Nikki Haley came out before and declared victory. Yes, yeah. I think it's because she has been goading him all week about his age. Yes. I think he's extremely sensitive about that. Mm-hmm. His dad, remember, died with Alzheimer's. Yeah. He is very sensitive, I think, about losing your marbles. Mm. And uh, the, given especially how much he's about appearance and, all, yep. and being Superman yes. and all that kind of stuff. Yep. And in her victory speech, she went out of her way to mm. go as hard as she could on that. Yes. And the, uh, I'll play you, I'll play you uh, a couple of clips to show you what I'm talking about. First of all, yep. this is um, – uh, oh, I should – I should just, for those who don't know, I should play the original clip as well. Okay. The original Nikki Haley confusion clip. Okay. This was, uh, I mean, you might, you've probably all seen it, but just in case you haven't, this was um, Trump getting her confused with Nancy Pelosi. This is, the, this, this is different to what you've heard before. This is the full context of the clip. Mm. You know, when she comes here, she gets like nine people and the press never reports the crowds, you know. By the way, they never report the crowd on January 6th. You know, Nikki Haley, Nikki Haley, Nikki Haley, you know, they, do you know they destroyed all of the information, all of the evidence, everything? Deleted and destroyed all of it. All of it because of lots of things. Like Nikki Haley is in charge of security. We offered her 10,000 people, soldiers, National Guard, whatever they want. 
They turned it down. They don't want to talk about that. The, so, the, the silence of the crowd. Yes, that was telling. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the important thing about that, that, though, is you notice at the beginning he's talking about Nikki Haley. Yes, When yeah. he says that nine people turn up yes, when, yeah, yeah, yeah. When, when she turns up. And then he just went straight to January 6th. Yes, yeah. So it's not like he was trying January 6th yes. and then he just had a slip of the yeah, slip yeah. of the brain with the name. I mean, we all do that sometimes. Yes, yeah. But he was talking about Nikki Haley. He had Nikki Haley in his head. Yes, yeah. And then his head somehow moved to January 6th yeah. and kept on talking Nikki Haley. That is weird. That's very weird. <laughs> that is one of the weirder brain freezes I've seen. Mm. Like certainly I, I find that one more oatmeal brain than anything else Trump has done, or Biden for that matter. Yes. Like, I think that one was weird. I agree. Anyway, and then Nikki Haley went big on that. She was talking about it for minutes and minutes in her stump speech. So this is an example of just, I just, I just taking one minute, mm. but she went on and on about it. Yeah. <laughs> and do we really want to go into an election with two fellas that are going to be president in their 80s? And that's not ageism that I'm saying here. We see that Biden has changed so much over two years. But last night, Trump is at a rally. And he's going on and on mentioning me multiple times as to why I didn't take security during the Capitol riots. Why I didn't handle January 6th better. I wasn't even in D.C. In, on January 6th. I wasn't in office then. They're saying he got confused, that he was talking about something else. He was talking about Nancy Pelosi. He mentioned me multiple times in that scenario. The concern I have is I'm not saying anything derogatory, but when you're dealing with the pressures of a presidency, we can't have someone else that we question whether they're mentally fit to do this. We can't. So that sure, that wasn't just a just a random drive by. She made that a focal point. Absolutely, yeah. yes, yeah, yeah. And then on on the night, this is what she said. And notice that she ties this the old person thing, yeah, to demanding a debate, which mm. she knows the media is going to be interested in. Yes, yeah, so yeah, she yeah. she makes sure this is the grab they use from her speech. Yes, this is the grab. The other day, Donald Trump accused me of not providing security at the Capitol on January 6th. <laughs> now, I've long called for mental competency tests for politicians over the age of 75. <laughs> Trump claims he'd do better than me in one of those tests. Maybe he would, maybe he wouldn't. But if he thinks that, then he should have no problem standing on a debate stage with me. Okay, so like I said, she clearly was intending that to be the takeaway grab. Yes. From like the 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 topic that Trump least wants people to talk about. Yes. He would have hated that. And I I'm I look, I can't read his mind, hmm. but I would bet big money that the moment when he really flipped his lid was when he heard that cr random crowd member go, geriatric, <laughs> yeah. in the middle of it all. Yeah. I reckon that's why he was so pissed off. Mm. He came out swinging. That, that, that's my take. And I think that the, it's really interesting because the Democrats have tried to tried to make Trump Trump equals old and mentally deficient a thing. Yes. For six months now. Yes, yeah. They really have tried. And online, there's been a bit of that. Mm. Like Democrats have certainly pushed that online. Yes, yeah. But it hasn't really been covered much by the mainstream press. No. But when Nikki Haley does it, it yes. gets covered by the mainstream press. Yes. Yeah, she yeah. has made this an actual talking point. Yes. Now, I'm not suggesting there's any chance yeah, yeah, yeah. that that age becomes a problem for Trump versus Biden. Mm, yeah. Like Biden looks feeble. He's never going to stop looking feeble. Yes, yeah, yeah. Trump does not look feeble. No. Right? And so Biden's always going to, if it's an age contest between Trump and Biden, Trump wins. 
but it does neutralize mm. the area that Trump really wants to be in. Yes, yeah. In a big way, I think. Yeah. And Nikki Haley is single-handedly fucking up his general election campaign. Yes, yeah. And the more she does it and the longer it goes, the more annoyed he's going to get, I think. Yes, yeah. So they are, I think that is something to watch out for, I would say. Mm. Um, do you have anything else to say about New Hampshire? No, I don't think so. No? Okay. Um, just flicking through here, seeing if I got anything else. Nah, nah. I think I think I've done enough. Uh, oh, actually, no. Oh, actually, so, sorry. Actually, one more thing. <laughs> one more thing. We're talking the old people thing. We shouldn't ignore. I almost forgot. Yes. We shouldn't ignore. Um, the other big winner from this week. We should pay tribute. There was one other big winner. Ryan Binkley. No, no. Ryan Binkley's always a winner, but <laughs> but not a big winner. Just a little winner. Uh, Elan. Elise, Elise Stefani. Oh. She won the thirstiest VP candidate award. <laughs> well done, Elise. And that's a, that's, that is a competitive race because Tim Scott oh, yes. is yes, sir, no, sir. As, yes. As, yeah, yeah, as, yeah. He's just standing behind Trump, just waiting to be called at any moment. Yes, yeah. Doing this huge cheerleader thing. It's so, like, it's, it's so depressing watching him go. Yes. Like, and he also announced his engagement yeah. as well, which some people – have rather cruelly suggested once again yeah. is purely for political purposes to yeah. appeal to Trump as his VP. Mm. I actually, I'm not being sarcastic when I say that. I, I, I mean, at the time when he first talked about this, whether he was yeah, really yes. yeah. going out with this girl or whether he was trying to hide being gay yeah. for, mm. for Republican candidate reasons, at the time I said I suspected that I thought it was for real. Yes, I'm sure it's for real. Yes, you yeah, don't yeah, get yeah. engaged for so, like not yes. in 2023. Yeah, 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 I mean, come on. Yeah, like I'm sure it's for real. Uh, I'm sure the timing isn't an accident. No. But but the but I'm sure it's for real. And yes, I think yeah, yeah. I think people suggesting that it's that, that it, it, he's hiding the gay thing. I think that's ridiculous. Yes, but I do find demeaning and a little bit depressing. Yeah, how much he is supplicating himself to Trump. Yes, and desperate to be. To be well, the and president. yeah, I mean, just L. Hardy alerted me to Trump's crack about, well, we never thought this was going to happen, <laughs> yes. which I think increases yeah. Scott's chance of becoming the vice president because now he's a reliable punchline. <laughs> yes. For Trump, he can make the same implied gay joke at every single rally. That is true. Yes. But, Dave, you're forgetting who won the first year's VP candidate. Oh, won. okay. Because Let's get back to Elise. Because then. Elise, oh, yeah, Tim Scott, he's, he's, yes. he's the runner-up. Okay. But Elise, oh my God! Number yep. one, she she attempted the impossible, what? which is to try to argue that Donald Trump did not confuse Nancy Pelosi and Nikki Haley. Really? Yes, she tried to pull it off, and she did a terrible job. Wow! Here we go. That isn't a mix-up. Uh, the reality is Nikki Haley... She wasn't speaker. Nikki Haley is relying on Democrats, just like Nancy Pelosi, uh, to try to have a desperate showing in New York, in New Hampshire. Wait, but he was so talking President about January Trump, 6th. President Trump has not lost a step. He is a stronger candidate, stronger than he is today, than he was in 2016, and he was in 2020. Compare that to Joe Biden's weakness. <laughs> yeah. So I don't oh, even understand that, that justification. Oh that justification doesn't even make sense. God. Like, like just shades of Iraqi information minister. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> really it's just a lack of self-respect. I know. There are just like, no standards. She will oh not drop below. Oh, my God. Like, people are acting as if Trump is going to live forever and there's never <laughs> going to be any kind of future after Trump where people might look back on that yeah. and think, was that really worth it? Yeah. Oh my god! Was that? Right? She's young. I know she's young, and she's 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 intelligent. Yeah, she's yeah. Intelligent she does not have to tie her future oh. to Trump. No. Um, it, I, it actually it reminds me of when I first did radio. Yes. And on Triple M, and yeah, and I was like twenty five at the time. Yes. And we were doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the I, I I referred to some of the aforementioned beatings I took. Yes. In, in those uh, in those early days, and and the the head of Triple M at the time. Yeah. Uh, was uh, it, we got offered some an ABC radio gig at the time. Yeah. And the uh, and. And it's funny, yeah, given that Craig's just taken up an ABC radio gig. Yes. Now. But this was 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. We're, we're off an ABC radio gig. And we asked, we asked this guy about yeah. whether what, what his thoughts were about that. Because he was also a bit of a mentor for us mm. as well. And he said, guys, look, yeah, you know, look, yeah, you can go wherever you want. I'm not, I'm not gonna bullshit you. Yeah, yeah. I just want to give you some real advice. But honestly, guys, you're a long time old. 
you're a long time old. Maybe just be young while you can. Wow. Yeah, which I thought was good advice. Yes. Like, yeah. Like you got a long time to be on ABC local yeah, radio yeah. if you want to. That's right. And it's, I've got the same advice for Elise Stefani. You're a, a long time old. And yeah, yeah, and it's just, and it's like, commit yourself to Trump now. Yeah, when you've yeah, got yeah. fifty years left in your career after he's finished. Yes, and you might not be able to live it down during that period. Is not good career management. Or to be VP. Mm. I don't know. I don't yes. know. Anyway, she's she's made that decision. That's for sure. Yeah. After that, that that classic. I'm going to keep that clip. That classic all time clip. <laughs> after that, she then followed up. Not on this topic, on a different topic. Yeah. Now, I'm not sure if you heard about this. The E.J. Carroll trial has been going on. Yes. It was delayed for a couple of days mm -hmm. because uh, the juror was sick. One mm -hmm. of the jurors was sick. And yep. they were going keep, to keep on going. Yes. But then uh, uh, Lena Harbour, uh, Lena Harbour, Trump's lawyer, yes, yeah, asked yeah. for it to be delayed because she felt sick as well. Right. And the judge said, fine. Well, at least delay for one day. Yep. Maybe two. We'll see. We'll yes. see. But at least one day. Mm -hmm. Uh Elise Stefanik responded on Twitter with, this is blatant election interference. Joe Biden and his Democrat cronies are the true threats of democracy. Trump 2024. What? This is because there was a delay. Now, the logic, the logic yeah. that she then tried to mm -hmm. use, because she just got dumped on yes, from yeah, everyone. Yeah, yeah. And she, the logic she tried to run with is they've delayed it one day, so Trump has to be there the day after, <laughs> which was New Hampshire Day. Yeah. Right? But number one, he didn't have to be there on New Hampshire Day. Number two, they'd already flagged it was going to probably be more than one mm. day. In fact, it's ended up being four days. Yes, yeah. Uh, number uh, and number three, like, come on, <laughs> like, just the suggestion. It was because it, it was in response to Trump's lawyer. Yeah, yeah. The suggestion is election interference. Just depressing. Like, she's so thirsty. That's why she won the award. Congratulations. The guy who gave Matt Gates his award should give Elise Stefanik her award. <laughs> Thirsty as well. VP. <laughs> okay, mate. Anyway, so okay. I did want to pay tribute to Elise Stefani. Mm. So anyway, we've done that. Yeah. Uh, let's talk Yemen. Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, now the, uh, jump in whenever you want. Okay. I'm, I'm just going to tell the story and you yep. jump in whenever you want. Sure, sure. The the Houthis are a or Houthis are a militant group in Yemen. Yep. They've been fighting a civil war there for over a decade. Yes. Uh, their official slogan is God is great, death to the US, death to Israel, curse the Jews, and victory for Islam. Catchy. Mm. Put it on a t-shirt, I'll wear it. They're, uh, they're essentially a proxy group for Iran mm -hmm. who have been arming them and training them, but they're a very independent proxy group. Yes. They do make their own decisions. That's right. And at times they really piss Iran off. Yes. And that we do need to emphasize that. Mm -hmm. been, people have been saying, oh, if you want to get the hoodies, get Iran. Mm. No, 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 no. They are an independent group. Yep. But, uh, until recently, they were designated a terrorist group. Yes. Uh, but then Biden removed the designation in 2021. He did that because it was interfering with giving aid to Yemen. Yep. And because uh, you, you can't really coordinate with people who are terrorists. Yes. And Yemen needs aid. It's the poorest country in the world. Mm hmm uh, from the end of November, they've been attacking ships in the Red Sea, trying to use the Suez Canal. You have to go right past... Uh, right past Yemen to leave the Red Sea. So mm -hmm. it, it's it's perfect for them to attack. Uh, they've been claiming that they only attack Israel-linked ships, mm. either going to or from Israel yep. or whatever. Uh, truth is they've attacked a lot more than that. Yep. They've attacked a lot of ships. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got the crew of a Japanese vessel, for instance, head for Italy, yes. held captive uh, by the militia for more than 40 days, yeah. for instance. Uh, at least 80% of the world's goods travel by sea mm. and nearly 30% of the world's container ships, 12% of global oil and gas supplies go past Yemen. Yes. So this is a big deal as yeah, far yeah. as money's concerned, right? It was forcing ships to sail all the way around Africa to go around the Mediterranean and underneath Africa to avoid them. I'll show you a map right there. You can see the ships, what they've had to do. It makes transport uh, about a week longer mm -hmm. and more expensive. Yes. Uh it was also opening up those transporters to Somali pirates who mm -hmm. tried their luck, although some Indian yep. sailors took care of them. But anyway, as of January 4, the cost of international shipping spiked by 173%. Mm. So that's what we're dealing with there. Yep. Also, the extra time taken for transport has a huge effect on supply lines, mm -hmm. uh, it creates log jams and shortages and so forth. Yes. Uh, they also have taken at least 25 hostages, we mm. should say. Um, now, 
what happened in response to that, America at first uh, uh, assembled a on December 19 a an operation called Operation Prosperity Guardian. <laughs> Very catchy name. Jesus. Put that on a T-shirt as well, please. Uh, Prosperity Guardian. Sounds like a televangelist who's a babysitter. <laughs> like you got Kenneth Copeland turning up when you want to go to the movies. Yes. Uh, anyway, um, look after the kids. It involves Britain, Bahrain, Canada, Netherlands, Norway, Seychelles. France, Italy, and Spain began as part of it, but within a few days they'd pulled out. Mm. Uh, about half the supposed parties refused to publicly declare their participation. Mm. And the reason for that is because they were worried about that joining the operation would suggest they support Israel's military operation. Right. And they didn't want any confusion that they no. don't support Israel's military operation. Uh, but at the beginning it began and as an interception mi- mm-hmm. mission. They were yep. just intercepting missiles. Now that was hard to maintain. Because obviously one day a missile is going to get through. Yep. Uh, it's actually happened a few times now. Mm-hmm. Um, and also the attacks have been slowly escalating over time, yep. getting more complicated. They're, they've been using cruise missile, missiles, ballistic missiles as well. And it's expensive. It costs only $2,000 for a drone for the Houthis. Mm. It costs America more than a million dollars yes. per intercept. So yeah, it adds yeah. up. Also, they can't reload when yes. they're on the ocean. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. eventually they're going to run out of intercepts and yes. there'll be some vulnerable ships. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, Biden and Blinken in response asked the Houthis to stop many times. Mm-hmm. They warned of consequences, did nothing. Frankly, it made them look a little bit weak. Mm-hmm. Uh, after the 26th Houthi attack on world ships, America saw the UN Security Council resolution and they got it. Uh, and that, that resolution demanded that the Houthis immediately end attacks on ships in the Red Sea and yes. it kind of endorsed Prosperity Guardian. Yes. The fact that neither China nor Russia vetoed the resolution shows how much of an issue those attacks are mm. because yeah, China and Russia are probably more on Hamas's side than Israel's side yes, in yeah, that yeah. conflict. But they don't like to pay a lot for their- For shipping. For shipping. No <laughs> one likes <laughs> to pay a lot for shipping. Exactly. And so they abstained in that yes. vote along with Algeria and Mozambique. Uh, after the 27th attack on in the Red Sea, which was the day after, yep. then America responded. Yes. Uh, they fired on 73 targets with Britain. They fired on 73 targets at 16 uh, locations with over 150 precision-guided munitions. Yes. That were supposedly chosen for their ability to degrade the Houthis' attacks. Uh, the military said they com- included command and control nodes, munitions de- depots, launching systems, production facilities, and air, tr- air defense radar systems. Mm-hmm. Um, Australia supported, as did Bahrain, Canada, and Netherlands. Uh, they uh, they actually flagged the attacks a few hours in advance mm. to give the Houthis a chance to leave. Yes, yeah. So no one need die. Yes. Uh, according to the Houthis, five people still did die. Mm. Six people injured. It also meant they had time to move their mobile equipment. Yes. Which most of their equipment is mobile. Yes. So they didn't necessarily get a huge amount of the equipment. Mm. Uh, apparently, they, they say the, st- the strikes damaged 20 to 30% of the Houthis' offensive capability. So my question to you, I have three questions. Yes. Is it right? Is it smart? Is it legal? Answer any, any of them. I don't know about the legal point. Okay, that's fine. Uh, the is other it- two would be an unequivocal no. Okay, so talk through. Um, uh, so is it right? I... I think that the world needs to stop dropping ordnance on Yemen. Yep. And uh, given everything that Yemen has been through over the last, uh, it, it's actually the last 20 years now. This war goes back to 2004. Yep. Sure. Um, the more recent addition of this war from 2015 to 2022 was widely recognised as a crime Mm. against the Yemeni people. Mm. And it's worth remembering that the US played a major role in supporting the Saudis and the Emiratis in that. Mm. And it actually got on people's consciences so much that uh, you actually had both houses of Congress um, uh, actually voting to end US support. Mm. which was overridden by Trump Mm. twice, and they didn't quite have enough vote. They actually came pretty close to overriding the presidential veto but couldn't Mm. get there. Um, And one of the first things that Biden did when he became president was to end the support for Mm. uh, that war, and it was very important that he did. Yeah, that was why the Houthis were undesignated Mm. as as a terrorist organisation. 
continuing to bomb the shit out of Yemen. And, uh, you know, if there's one lesson that we have learned ever since aerial warfare has been a thing, it's that there are real limits to how precisely you can, you know, you can bomb anything. Um, I just... I just don't see it as right. And yeah, I know what the economic consequences of this are with, with the shipping and everything, but I I cannot bring myself to think of this as right. In terms of is it smart? Uh, hang, on, hang on, before we do the smart, let's, let's do the right a bit more. Yeah, like, yeah. Let's just talk about that a bit more. Yes, yeah. So, so okay, so so are you saying that, that even if they're – just taking out radar locations and missiles and all the rest of it, they just they they can't be as precise as they pretend. No, and there's and they're going to cause enough corollary. I assume you don't care about them taking out a missile, but you're saying the corollary yeah, yeah, yeah. damage, yeah, yeah, yeah. is going to be too great yeah, yeah. to to justify. It. Yep, yep. Okay, all right. Um, what would you say to the argument that that yeah, if that uh the fact that um, America waited until there were twenty seven attacks and they warned them mm. constantly, uh, the fact that 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 Houthis just weren't responding yeah, yeah, justified yeah. some kind of response from America. What would you say to that? Um, look, I under I understand that argument, but mm. if they wanted to stop the attacks, what they needed to do was to bring the Gaza war to a quick end. Mm. Which they showed no interest in doing. Do you think America can bring the Gaza war to a quick end? They they could have done a much better job with that mm. than they have. Okay. Um, uh, so, I mean, like this is something else that we've talked about mm. a lot, mm. uh, but that's how the attacks will actually end. Mm. Um, yeah. Uh, now, okay. is, let's go, let's go to, is it smart then? Is it smart? Well, how about we have a look at the interview with Biden mm. about this? Let's do that. <laughs> and let's just ask, does this sound smart to you? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are the airstrikes in Yemen working? Well, when you say working, are they stopping the Houthis? No. Are they going to continue? Yes. Are they working? No. Are they going to continue? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and, I mean, this gets to the is it right point as well. Mm. Like if there's not any, mm. even any strategic value to it, mm. then why are you doing it? Now, mm. At this point, I've got to defer to somebody who's an actual expert about this. So this is my friend and colleague, Sarah Phillips, is Professor of Global Conflict and Development at the University of Sydney. Um, The kind of research that she does makes the rest of us look like a bunch of cowards. (laughs) Cowards, <laughs> right? Sure. right? The the places that she goes, Yemen, Somaliland, <laughs> the things that she has to take into account when she does her research, like the biggest physical risks that I'm running when I do my research, is that a pile of books is going to fall on my head. She actually <laughs> she actually thinks about you know how she has to be able to deal with people carrying guns and things uh, things like that. Uh, she is this utterly fearless and very brilliant researcher. And she wrote a very good piece on Yemen in the conversation on Monday, which I would highly recommend. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll we'll put, put the, a put in the homework. We'll put a link to it, yeah. and um, you know, so Biden's already said that they're not working, and she's got the reasons why they're not going to work. Right, yeah. it, it's not going to turn around just by um, doing more strikes. Do, do you remember part of what she said? Yeah, yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll give the three reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Reason number one is that the Houthis have been withstanding airstrikes since 2004. Yeah. Withstanding airstrikes is what they do. Mm. It's the the constant airstrikes which have enabled them to develop their entire method of warfare and also their entire method of governance Mm. uh, as well. Um, So more airstrikes now are not uh, not going to dislodge them. Second thing is she points out the Houthis are not popular in... Yemen. Mm. People do not like the direction that the that the Houthis are pushing them in. They do not like life under the Houthis. Yeah. This has actually given them some kind of legitimacy. Mm. Right? This, this appears to give some truth to what they've actually uh, been claiming. Mm. So th- not only is this not dislodging them, if anything, this is entrenching them. Mm. And she said the third thing, this comes back to a point that I made earlier, was this is an expression of the broader regional rage over Gaza. Mm. 
Um, like, yes, you can see it as cynical, opportunistic, hypocritical. It, it's all of those things. Mm. Uh, at the same time, there's a lot of genuine rage there. Mm. And as I said, this issue is not getting resolved until Gaza uh, mm. gets resolved. So, mm. not, so not only is it not right, I don't think, um, it's not smart. Mm. Legal, I've got no idea. At this point, I think that uh, legal is beside the point. Okay. Um, all right, well, I'll say I'll add a couple of things. The first thing is that uh, my my view on is it smart, is it right, is it legal, is that I'd say, I mean, I, look, I, I acknowledge every every point you've just made, that especially yeah. about the Houthis have been, well, like, Yemen has been bombed enough. Mm. I do agree with that. I do feel like, like you know, to draw, I mean, this, is not, this is far from a perfect analogy, but if, if I was covered head to toe in Kevlar mm. and you shot me 27 times yep. and I was carrying a gun, I think you would expect to get shot back at some point. Yes, in time. yeah. <laughs> and so, the, uh, and so I, like, I don't think it's an outrage that America is, especially if America is trying to target missiles. Mm. And I yeah. believe them when they say yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Like they keep on emphasising we, we really don't want to pick a fight with the Houthis. We mm. just want them to stop bombing us. Mm. And so we're, we're just trying to grade their capacity as much yeah, yeah. as we possibly can. Uh, I, yeah, so I, I, I'm not so worried about mm. that so much. And especially if they keep on flagging attacks in advance when they yes, do yeah, proper yeah. attacks, I like that. Um, but um, I think that, uh, and also I should just on, on the long same lines, I mean, you've already touched on this. We should just say we shouldn't make the he- the Houthis into heroes here. No, of course because not. No. They, because because I know you won't. But yeah, just yeah, like, yeah, some yeah. people have. Yeah, and just because because uh, what Sarah? I mean, I haven't read Sarah's article, but but yeah, there's a reason they're not popular. Yes, like they are currently laying siege to a city in Yemen. Yeah, cutting off their water supply in a way very similar yes. to what they are angry about. Mm. Israel doing in Gaza. Yes, yeah. Like they, in fact, they've they, in some areas they've reinstituted slavery. Yes, like they're not yeah, yeah. good guys. No, right. But the um, but having said that. For me, is that is it smart? Is the key question. Mm. Like, which because I think, I think I agree with the arguments why it's not smart. Yes, I think that the, I think it's giving the Houthis a lot more clout than they otherwise had. Yeah. I think that's absolutely true. Yeah, I think that uh, I think that one of the reasons why America wanted to do it was yes. to stop escalation. Mm. They're worried about a con- like like the the saying which I read a number of times yeah, was a yeah. concern that. Yeah, we can keep on intercepting these missiles. Yeah. Well, let's just say one gets through and kills an American sailor. Mm. Then you've got a problem because yeah, then yeah. there's enormous pressure for a much bigger response. Yes, yeah. Right? They are, and they're trying to avoid that situation before it begins. Yeah. But this path also leads to escalation. Yes, yeah, yeah, And we've yeah. actually seen it yeah. since, the, since si- this is not the, the, the airstrikes didn't stop with one. There's been yeah, seven, yeah. I think, so far, maybe even eight. Mm. And the Houthis have been responding with bigger missiles. Yes, yeah, yeah. And so we are heading towards escalation. Yeah, yeah. And that is something that you don't want. Yeah, yeah. So now I don't, I don't think there's any perfect answers here. No. Um, the uh, but I think that the while while I totally understand the logic behind yeah yeah behind it from a from a right point of view, I think from a from a real politic point of view, I'm not sure it's the best strategy. No. It, um, I think something like, let's go big picture here. Yeah. So if the rich world's economic prosperity mm. depends on the fact that ships can just sail past the world's poorest and most destroyed country without any kind of harassment whatsoever, mm. that's a very fragile basis of yeah. a global political economy. Well, I think that's true. Yeah. Like <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. Um, and, yeah. you know. And it, it, and, and, the, and the other place they sell past is just as poor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and in Central America. But the fact that we kind of take that for, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. the, the fact we take that for granted and it shows how deeply ingrained basically two centuries of, first of all, British and then American maintenance of the global economy through naval supremacy is. But we should never take that for granted. Mm. Um, uh, we, yeah, yeah, we should never take for granted that uh, all of this good stuff that we get sent to us s- s- sails past mm. uh, this incredibly poor and destroyed country that mm. a lot of other countries helped to make poor and helped to, uh, you know, and helped to destroy and we're, we're just going to believe that, that we can always do that peacefully. Mm-hmm. Uh, for what's worth, the, is it legal? I know yeah. you, and there's not a question you're interested in, but just a very quick answer. Because uh, Ro Khanna uh, 
was echoed by a lot of people yes, on yeah, this. Yeah. Rokhan was saying he's a congressman. Yeah. A Democrat congressman was saying he thinks it's not legal. Mike Lee, Matt Gates, Thomas Massey, Cory Bush, Sarah Jacobs, Rashida Tlaib all agree. Um, <laughs> Did you have to say Matt Gates? <laughs> well, I mean, th- this is an area where Matt Gates has been pretty consistent, actually. Matt Gates has never been a big fan of foreign intervention. Mm, okay. It's true. Yeah. They're, like, there they're, they're, they're are lights and shades to all of us. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, Ro Khanna said, the president needs to come to Congress before launching a strike against the Houthis in Yemen and involving us in another Middle East conflict. That is Article 1 of the Constitution. I'll stand up for that regardless of whether a Democrat or Republican is in the mm. White House. Section 2C of the War Powers Act is clear. POTUS may only, president may only introduce the US into hostilities after congressional authorization or in a national emergency when the US is under imminent attack. Reporting is not a substitute. That is a, this is a retaliatory offensive strike. We should mention... Every president since the War Powers Act was instituted has violated that. Absolutely. Yes. That is absolutely true. <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't, still, doesn't mean it's not written yeah, down, but still. it is just worth mentioning that that is it's one of the most violated uh, acts that there is. That yeah. is true. I should just read section, yeah, yeah. you're right. Section yeah, 1541C of the War Powers Resolution is what he's referring to. It says the constitutional powers of the president's commander in chief to introduce United States armed forces into hostilities or into situations where imminent involvement in hostilities is clearly indicated by circumstances are exercised only pursuant to one, a declaration of war, two, specific statutory authorization, or three, a national emergency created by attack upon the United States, its territories or possessions or its armed forces. In other words, if it's national emergency, you can do it. Yeah. If it's self-defense, you can do it. The question is, is this self-defense? Uh, the fact that they waited for 27 attacks suggests mm. it's not really self-defense. No. Um, the... Uh, but is it legally considered self-defense? Because obviously they were fired upon many, mm. many times. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, from what I can gather, the legal scholars I've been reading suggest that this will be considered self-defense in a court of law. But we don't know. We don't know. Let's see if someone takes them to the Supreme Court. Yeah. I mean, as you say, presidents do this routinely and no one gives a shit. Yes. But if, but if they actually do, I'd be interested to know. Because yeah, yeah. to me, it's not a clear cut case either way. That's right. Like yes. it's a really kind of grey area. Yeah. Um. So anyway, so I just just flagged that. Uh, I should say uh, anything else about this? No. no. Oh yeah, the terrorism des- 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 designation thing. Ah, oh, forget that. That's, that's such a minor legal thing. Uh, like they've they've redesignated them as a not a as a foreign terrorist organization, but as a special designated global terrorist organization. <laughs> Which apparently means that they can get more aid in. Ah. Like they're just trying to get more aid in. Okay. Essentially. Right. Like they like the the Biden administration seems very concerned about aid, which is a yeah. good thing. Yeah, yeah. And if they if they increase the aid while they're bombing, that might be uh, that, that could that could help. But uh, just <laughs> let's just get the aid going, then, hey. Um. Anyway, that's enough of that. Yeah. Uh, stats nuggets. Stats, stats nuggets. Nugget. Stats nugget. Woo. Okay. Um, the share of black men in the labor force. Mm. I'm going to show you a graph, Dave. Yep. This is a graph. It was mm-hmm. a steady five to six points lower than white men for a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he can see it, minus 5%. Yep. So yeah, so basically a flat line from 2000 through to 2014, minus 5%. Yeah, yep. And then between 2014 to 2016, it increased by, but what, 2%? Mm-hmm. Not close to the white men. Yep. Then it stayed and then it's gone up. Look at this. It's almost hit zero. The labor force participation rate between black men and white men is almost at the same level mm. for the first time ever. Wow. This hasn't influenced their wages. Mm. Black men men still have 20% less yes, yeah, on yeah. average than white men, mm-hmm. uh, which is the same as 20 years ago. Yep. But the the it's a step in the right direction. Yes, yep. So I just wanted to, Absolutely, that, yes. I just want to flag it because yep. that, that's not something you hear very often. No. And yeah, some people might look at the fact it went up in the last half of Obama's administration mm. and went up again under Biden. Yes. I'm not making a partisan point here. I'm not saying okay. that, that the Democrats did anything in particular for that. Yep. I don't know why it's gone up. Right. But it's gone up. Okay. So let's just acknowledge yes. it. Yes. Uh, do you have time to talk about the ICJ quickly? No. You don't. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That is okay. That is okay. All right, well, I might do. It, it's too big and too complicated an issue to, okay, to do, you, do a quickie Do you on. want to talk about the ICJ? 
Maybe next week. Yeah. Okay. So as in, as in, as in, should I, I don't, I want you to talk about it, but in, in an adequate amount of time. Okay. Okay. Yep. So, so, so if I'm asking, do we put this off to next week or do I talk about this now without you? You, you prefer to put it off to next week. Yes. So you can talk about it. Okay. Then yep. That's what we'll do. Okay. Good. Next week, I'll put, let, let's put on the nose board. Yes. I, I CJ. Yep. And uh, also, uh, I think we should talk about the Chevron case. Okay, yes. that's going to be a big one. Okay, yeah. we can look forward okay. to that. One final thing, which yes. is the Michigan football update. Please. All right. It's the, the Michigan, Michigan corner. So okay. as <laughs> as I predicted, Jim Harbour yeah. has uh, left the University of Michigan to he take did. up the coaching job with the Los Angeles Chargers. So even though he said, uh, you know, when I die, all I want them to put on my grave is he was a Michigan man he'd probably also like and won a Super Bowl as well. Now, whether he'll be able to do that with the Los Angeles Chargers, I don't know. But Mm. uh, this was a widely expected move. Sounds like he won't. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they're, they're something of a benighted franchise, the sure. Los Angeles Chargers, which I think had a lot to do with them being in San Diego for so long, but they haven't got – well, they've, they've had a very mixed record in Los Angeles, let's put it that way. Um, but the Detroit Lions won a second playoff game in a row at home. Uh, so the state of Michigan is in football ecstasy. <laughs> At the moment, they beat the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. That sets up a matchup with the San Francisco 49ers for the NFC Championship. Now, uh, San Francisco is heavily favoured going into this game, Mm -hmm. but they had to work surprisingly hard to beat the Green Bay Packers last week, who are not as good as the Lions. So it is possible that the Lions could get to the Super Bowl. We'll check in about that uh, next week. But anyway, so for... Uh, you know, for those who want a bandwagon to climb on, I'd say the Lions are as good as any. That's very exciting news. Yes. I always want a bandwagon to climb on. Uh, let's finish off with another Stats Nugget. Why not? Mm. Uh, stats, stats Nugget. Stats Nugget. Woo! There's also just a random piece of news. Yes. I'm not, I'm not saying this is a big deal. Okay. Yep. US life expectancy in 2022 increased from 76.4 to 77.5 years ah. after declining for two years in a row. Right. The main reason it increased was because, can you guess? Uh, COVID wasn't as fatal anymore. You got it. Yes. Less COVID deaths. Uh, there were 460,000 in 2021, but there were 244,000 in 2022. Mm. Uh, it also might explain those 244,000 deaths. Yeah. That continued might explain why the life expectancy is, st- expectancy is still lower than 2019's 78.8 years. Mm. Uh, life expectancy went up 2.3 years for American Indians and Alaskan Natives, by 2.2 years for Hispanic Americans, and by 1.6 years for Black Americans. Unsurprisingly, they're the groups that suffered the most from COVID deaths. Mm-hmm. So, good. There you go. Okay. <laughs> so, good. On that note, optimistic note to end on. <laughs> yeah, well, yes. Things are going up. Uh, okay, guys. Well, hopefully, we're not. This podcast wasn't massively out of date by the time it gets to your ears on. Uh, <laughs> Friday uh, Friday late Friday <laughs> afternoon or early Friday evening. Yes. I, I, and if not, we might do more Thursdays because this was quite pleasant. Yes. <laughs> uh, it was. All anyway, right. Thank you very much, Dr. Dave. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Peppers. Stay peppy. Stay peppy.